the December 2018 Next Year Security Policy Dialogue. My name is Patrick, Patrick Okibo. I'm a principal partner at Next Year. We're really excited that you created time to join us this morning. Um, in a little bit, I'll invite uh, my colleague and partner uh, to welcome us to this event. Um, he is Amara Wampa. Amara is the Director of Public Policy Initiative at the Yaradua Foundation. He's responsible for developing and managing public policy programs in line with the Foundation's objectives and values. Amara has been very actively involved in national advocacy and youth mobilization since 2009 influencing public policy and governance processes, particularly with regards to energy and elections. This event is organized in collaboration with the Yaradua Foundation, and please join me with a round of applause as we invite Amara to the stage. Um, good morning, everybody. Okay. Um, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to this policy dialogue on breaking the stalemate organized by next year uh, SPD in partnership with the Sheikh Musayagra Foundation. Over the past decade, Nigeria has battled a radical and violent insurgency in the northeastern part of the country. Although the government claims that Boko Haram is technically defeated, the group remains resilient. Since 2009, Boko Haram has mounted over 1,600 attacks, killing an estimated 15,000 Nigerians, injuring over 6,000, and taking over 2,000 hostages. An estimated 2 million Nigerians have been internally displaced, 3 million children have had their schooling interrupted, 440,000 of them suffer severe acute malnutrition with 88,000 at risk of death. Starting in late January 2015, a coalition of military forces from Nigeria, Chad, Cameroon, and Niger began a counterinsurgency campaign against Boko Haram. The campaign successfully recaptured the majority of the territory the campaign successfully recaptured the majority of the territory previously held by the extremist group and freed thousands of hostages. By December 2015, it was reported that Boko Haram had retreated to the islands on Lake Chad, and President Buhari declared the group technically defeated. But by 2017, Boko Haram had fully regained the capacity to mount serious attacks on both civilian and military targets. Nigeria and we failed to finish off a weakened Boko Haram allowing it to recruit on the arm. And this has resulted in a bloody stalemate with no end in sight. There is concern that the conflict has become sufficiently lucrative that belligerent and humanitarian actors now see an incentive in prolonging it. Today's forum will serve as an opportunity to explore feasible and pragmatic solutions to achieve peace, security, and robust development in the northeast of Nigeria. Discussions will focus on creating the right incentives for key stakeholders to end the conflict and focus on building peaceful communities. The Yaradua Foundation is proud to contribute to the growth of civic spaces in Nigeria. We remain committed to providing platforms for dialogue to foster, uh, to foster a prosperous and inclusive nation. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Amara. I'm sure we all got the agenda as we signed in, so no point in going over the agenda again, but um, it's my distinct honor and privilege 
to invite a keynote speaker, Alaji Tijani Tunsla is the vice chairman at the Presidential Committee on Northeast Initiatives. PCNI was established by President Muhammadu Buhari to serve as the primary body responsible for national strategy, coordination, and advisory to, for all humanitarian interventions, transformational and development efforts in Northeast Nigeria. PCNI is designed to oversee all remedial programs aimed at addressing the crisis in the Northeast since 2009. So we're really fortunate and uh, pleased and honored to have the Vice Chairman of PCNI to present uh, his keynote address. I think the protocol is to say good morning all. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, I welcome you all to this for a monthly next year security policy dialogue, which aims to provide a platform for academics, practitioners, and broad policy community to get together often to seek solutions to the security challenges facing Nigeria. This month's session is focused on the ongoing war on Boko Haram and seeks to answer how to unlock the stalemate between Nigeria's military and the terrorist organization. As you are aware, in almost a decade, the Nigerian military has waged a war against Boko Haram insurgency in much of the Northeast. In response to the unprovoked killings and destruction of assets by members of the radical Islamic sect, the government and its allies have relied on the use of force to curtail this violence. Indeed, a number of Boko Haram fighters have been killed, several others detained, and the fighters' bases in Sambisa Forest and Goza Hills captured by the Nigerian troops. Despite these successes, the war against terror is far from over. The sustained pressure from the Nigerian military has forced Boko Haram fighters to change tactics and campaign strategies. Rather than holding territories as they did in much of 2014 and early part of 2015, Boko Haram insurgents have switched to guerrilla tactics of hit and run, the use of suicide bombers, ambush or surprise attacks and attacking soft targets, especially in the rural areas. As a result, although the capacities of the Boko Haram have been sufficiently diminished, violence remains formidable and poses continued threat to security and peace across the Northeast, especially in Borno, Adamawa, and your states. In addition to the immense loss of lives and properties, about two million persons have been displaced from their homes, and several thousands have been forced to seek refuge outside Nigeria as refugees. Sadly, even though makeshift camps have been provided for some displaced persons by government and non-governmental organizations, they are still vulnerable. Ironically, Boko Haram insurgents have launched some ambitious, violent campaigns against military bases in recent times. The seeming strengthening of Boko Haram fighters have made civilians increasingly insecure and vulnerable. 
As the war on Boko Haram enters its tenth year in a few months, it has become imperative to reflect on the conflict, reassess the challenges and provide solutions. The challenges include the infrastructure for intelligence gathering, coordination among security operatives and a growing pipeline of potential recruits for the insurgents. As the military continues in its efforts to win a decisive and complete victory over the insurgents, the government of Nigeria, under the leadership of President Mohamed Buhari, initiated and funded the Buhari Plan as a blueprint focused on rebuilding lives and reconstructing the Northeast. Concerted efforts will be required to rebuild after the devastation caused by the insurgency. More importantly, there is need to rebuild the economic generation capacity of the region to cut off the recruitment pipeline and ensure there is no relapse into the insurgency. According to the 2016 Northeast Recovery and Peace Building Assessment, about $9 billion of damage was recorded across the six northeastern states with the North experiencing the largest impact. Based on these conditions, Presidential Committee on the Northeast Initiative, TCNI, was established to coordinate all intervention efforts in the region as contained in the Buhari Plan. Some of the current intervention programs PCNI is driving has received support from donor agencies, bilateral and multilateral development agencies, including the Inclusive Basic Services Delivery Livelihood Empowerment Integrated Program, otherwise the IBISP, SIP. The Northeast Recovery and Stabilization Program the multi-sectoral crisis recovery project, or no package, and now the United Nations new way of war. However, as PCNI strives to rebuild and reconstruct the region with what seems like conflict rightness, it is time to search for new ways of ending the conflict. The Presidential Committee on Northeast Initiatives is investing heavily of peace building, interfaith dialogue, and transitional justice frameworks for the region. This is in addition to the coordination efforts in agriculture and other development efforts. The pertinent question, therefore, is how can Nigeria evolve a winning strategy for peace and food security? This is the question this conference seeks to explore. We are grateful to the organizers of the conference, next year XPD, in partnership with the Shia Musa El Adua Foundation, for putting together a team of experts drawn from the military, the policy community, academia, civil society, and donor agencies to brainstorm on how to rebuild the lives and win sustainable peace for the region. Indeed, insurgent violence in the Northeast has elicited policy responses locally and internationally. Quite a large number of government departments, local and foreign NGOs, and donor agencies are doing a lot of job in caring for the displaced, rebuilding schools and other public utilities. And in general, building the peace. But the impact of these interventionist efforts needs effective coordination of the programs. In the course of this conference, participants will discuss strategies to engender the much needed coordination for optimum effectiveness of humanitarian and environmental interventions. What are the other strategic options for resolving the conflict. In the course of this conference, participants will discuss the use of conciliation tactics, 
including disarmament, demobilization, and integration, as well as approaches for sustainable food security. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all fruitful deliberations, and I thank you so much for listening. And with this keynote address, it really sets the tone for what we hope to achieve today. And some of the objectives from this dialogue um, are to one, profile feasible and pragmatic solutions to achieving peace, uh, security, and robust development in the Northeast. Create solutions Focus, solutions focus collaboration between academics, policymakers, uh, political class, and international community. And three, to increase the capacity of participants to address conflict and security issues with the aim of building peaceful communities. Essentially, all ideas should be put on the table. Um, nothing should be left out, because our hope is that some of the ideas we generate here can find their way into policy and shape the way the Nigerian government prosecutes the war so we can bring it to a logical and final conclusion so that PCNI can uh, make much more progress with the rebuilding of lives and redevelopment of the region. To do this, we'll, we'll do it in two sessions. The first session will focus on winning the peace and we'll invite Dr. Ibrahim Umara. Uh, to present the first paper. Dr. Umara is a, one of the leading scholars in conflict studies in Nigeria. He's a senior lecturer in the Department of Political Science at the University of Midugri. So, in effect, you can say he lives and works at the epicenter of the conflict. And he's also with the Center for Peace, Diplomatic and Development Studies at the University of Midugri. The topic of his paper is winning the peace, interrogating Nigeria's approaches in the Northeast conflict. Please a round of applause as Dr. Mara approaches. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, my distinguished professor, my colleagues and uh, the participants, I feel highly honored to be invited to talk on this subject on of invitation. <coughs> and um, the little discussions that we have will aid within the context of the evolution of the militia movement that is called Boko Haram, the responses to curtail the particular demands by the Nigerian state, the successes so far, the statement court and unquote at this claim, and then the way forward. So first, contrary to most of the opinions that Boko Haram is ideologically ingrained, is a complete misconception. Because the particular movement is divided into two. One was based on the movement to counter the waves of corruption and by exploiting those that were highly vulnerable in the society, particularly the scholars and the students of the Sankara Institution, meaning the Quranic School, who were not opportune by organizing a sort of day-to-day -day Quranic recitation competition by wounding financially, has led them to succeed in attracting them, court and unquote, they were not part of the movement, rather they were invited in form of competition. Remember that they were not members. They were four, they were invited to compete with one another in the skills of Quranic competition. And through the remuneration of 500 naira a day, they have succeeded in retaining some. That is one thing that I want you to understand. It has nothing to do with al -Majiri. It is carefully constructed agenda to deconstruct the established identity of the people of the state. Mm -hmm. Two, at the height of social problem orchestrated by the corruption, 
particularly on the side of the government, where massive youths were not engaged in gainful employment, the state government mistakenly engaged in what we call the politics of poverty alleviation by distributing motorcycles to the youths. That policy was taken over by labor movements who saw that the meager salary cannot sustain them. They now engage in also distributing motorcycles to their members, which were leased out to the unemployed youths to engage them in gainful employment. The reckless driving of motorcycling in the state forced the state government to enact a law in order to protect the people. That law was to come impose the wearing of crash helmets. Unfortunately, when substantial part of the youth had adhered to the law by wearing crash, uh, crash helmet, the members of the particular set refused. So in one land, you have two laws. If you do not belong to the Yusufia movement, because we don't call them Boko Haram or the Jazz, all these were coined by the British. It wasn't coined by themselves, nor by the people. They have never called themselves Boko Haram. They have never called themselves Jazz or Jamaat al Sunnah. It was coined. I'm coming to that later. I wanted to really uh, uh, create a scenario for you to properly understand the basis. That's why I'm going to that. Now, the 500 naira balance expected of each motorcyclist was slashed by the Boko Haram movement. And that attracted youth to go into the Boko Haram. One, they don't demand 500 naira as a balance for day from the cyclists. Two, you don't wear crash helmet. If you belong to that, you don't wear crash helmet. And young people are much more eager to ensure that they didn't wear crash helmet. So they were not from the Yusufia movement, but they pretend to be like from the Yusufia movement because they wanted not to wear the particular crash helmet. That ambivalence of the state law enforcement agencies had created huge recruitment channel to Boko Haram to recruit more. With the evolution of Operation Plush, the Nigerian police observatory force that were created by the state government in order to ensure the wearing of clash elements had also not helped matters. Once you are not wearing crash helmet and you are identified that you don't belong to that particular sect, the motorcycle will be confiscated. People were humiliated. And people felt that if, because of not wearing crash helmet and we were loyal citizens, we were punished because we were not wearing crash helmet, what would happen if we joined a particular sect? So that thing made the British intelligence to target a state-orchestrated terrorism. It is a state ambivalence. And it is the state insensitivity that allowed the proliferation of that particular movement. These are the three instances. The fourth instance was when they start open criticism of the government, when they had been in a sort of uneasy relationship with the actual communities. They were forced to leave out the communities, establish their centers, that is called Marcas. They call it even Taimia Center. From there, they have cells. They have police. They have the military. They engage in joint exercises that look like that of military and paramilitary. And before the watch of the Nigerian police and the Nigerian armed forces, nobody ever talked about it. What do you think about that? Is it not another anatomy that will motivate you to join the particular guards group? Nobody reported. But the Nigerian State Security Services have reported. The leader of the particular movement was arrested three times and was always released on the day. Who was behind his day? And whenever he was called to my degree, he was given a very rousing welcome, like a head of state. All the reports were there. 
until when they have started some sort of targeted assassination that was full of conspiracy. Go to the archive of Nigerian television authority. When the Nigerian army in 21 armed brigade in Maladibara engaged in such mission, they found out it was a Nigerian police inspector that was found with military uniform and with some machine guns. He apologized to the people of Morocco said, on television. On attacking the Nigerian army, he will be paid the sum of 300,000 naira if he succeeded in killing the military. If he succeeded in killing the police, it is 150,000 naira. What happened to that attestation, ordinarity, that was already being on the television? Up to now, you have it on the archives of the Nigerian television authority. So the whole idea is surrounded by huge conspiracy. But this paper is concerned <coughs> with the outburst of the Boko Haram itself. It started in the process of in, uh, uh, imposing the crash element. It started all around, around custom roundabout, where they had as skirmishes with the team of the Nigerian uh, security agencies. And then the leader of that moment came out openly and said, we were going to retaliate. The audio cassette was everywhere. What was the response of the Nigerian security agencies? At that time, they were playing a sort of political card. They were using the movement as a political scorecard. At the state level, they wanted to use the huge followership to serve as a support base for the ruling political party. And then we had a very easy national cohesion challenges. The North against the South. And there are a sort of social psychological apathy among Nigeria. The imagined identity of us versus them, the North versus South. And it has given a seeming political perception to the southern political establishment. And it's also given a seeming political perspective to the northern political establishment. Particularly in the southern part of the country, they said it is a scheming of the northern political establishment to destabilize a Christian southern led government. That was the mistake. So the federal government was irrelevant. And when it came out of hand, when they intervened, they intervened wrongly. The military that were deployed under the Joint Task Force cannot differentiate who is Boko Haram and who is not. And of course, that is the nature of the military training. Whenever you are fired, you only retaliate to this direction of where the fire is coming from. If there is bomb blast, it was an indiscriminate retaliation and retribution. Excessive use of force, disproportionate utilization of the force. Entire communities, entire business centers were raised. And uh, there are too many instances in which the moment when the joint task finishes their operation, the Boko Haram movement will appear to the community. We ask you to join us, you refuse to join us. Now you are suffering from the hands of the Nigerian state. And it is not the fault of the Nigerian military. It is the fault of the people of the state, the Nigerian police, and the Nigerian security services because of miscommunication. A soldier that is either deployed in Pataco or in Lagos to quit this type of insurgency will be told that he will be in a coffin. They were already informed that the guns were hidden under a wheelbarrow. Even a woman can struck. To them, there is nothing like that. So they cannot distinguish between who is Boko Haram and who is not because they were all early, they were told the way they were. It should have been the Nigerian police and the SSS to draw the attention of the military establishment. But no, these people do not consider, uh, consider up to one person. But we were attacked as all of us were either Boko Haram or we were <coughs> sympathizers. Either active 
or dormant Boko Haram. That was how the people of the state were seen. In the disproportionality, the military also engaged in what they called a defensive operation. They don't go out on patrol. If you see the military movement, they are only moving to reinforce on the scenes of an incident. Right within the formation of the Joint Task Force, Boko Haram will proudly say that they are going to attack so-so area. After the attack, it will be followed by retaliatory attacks that will be more damaging to the people. That's why the government at that forum said, look, we don't want the military because they were even worse than the Boko Haram. Since we are not following the channel, that was what the government at that forum told to the then president of Nigeria, Dr. Jonathan Ibele Goodluck. That look, if this is the way you are handling it, it's better you would draw your soldiers. We know how to handle our matters. Why? Because in a community where a vigilant team and a volunteer youth would move in to arrest Boko Haram, that will be handed over to the military. The military, with all their training and weapons, cannot go into that day. That created a sort of loss of confidence on the people as to whether the military were there to do the actual job. So now the young people in the state become targets, not only for the Boko Haram, but even for the Nigerian military. Because they are either active or don't Boko Haram. With their drug net, they don't discriminate. The Boko Haram also attack the youths. No school, no work, no business activities, no driving, nothing. The youth took it upon themselves that says it is going to be that it is better we risk our life. That was how the civilian JTF evolved. Let us be with the Nigerian military. Let us take it on ourselves to protect ourselves. They volunteered. Without machine gun, without anything, they moved into the deal of Boko Haram. They defeated the Boko Haram with the support of the Nigerian military. Boko Haram was completely routed out from the state capital. But again, surprisingly, when the Chibo girls were abducted, our people mobilized in Maiduguri that we are going into the bush to just kill our sisters. All of us, all of us mobilized in Ramat Square that we want to move in. The then de facto Minister of Information, the then Director General of National Orientation Agency came out on the media that we don't have to go to the bush. If we go there, we are on our own. We couldn't go. No enforcement to rescue these abducted school girls. In less than three weeks, Goza was attacked. No response. In less than four weeks, Bama was under fire. For 24 hours, the Nigerian gallant troops were fighting Boko Haram for 24 hours. Which type of sincerity? As far as from Lagos and from Patako, you can Send the support. What are the essence of paratroopers? No reinforcement. Either in terms of personnel or in terms of logistics to support the soldiers that are bottling the Kankari Boko Haram on Kanao. They have exhausted what they had. And what do you do if you don't have weapon? You retreat. The Nigerian military retreated. We were only lucky that the Nigerian Air Force went there to bombard the uh, uh, ammunition depot of the brigade for them to weaken the Boko Haram. And ever since they started expanding, Kalabalgi, <coughs> Jigwa, Ngara, Marte, Mambu, Kuka, Buzama. In 27 local governments, the local governments that did not come under the occupation of Boko Haram were principally from the Bureau Emirates. Bureau local government, Hawaii local government, Kwayagosa local government, Bio local government, and Shani local government. Alongside the Metropolitan and Chile, only seven local governments were not occupied 
or invaded by Boko Haram and Askira Oba. Yet they were subjected to constant attack. No enforcement, no actual and real political commitment. The most silent thing again is, after the assassination of Emir Okoza, we had a report that the president was asking whether Boza is in Borno or in Adamawa State. How can you make a name and people under constant attack? As a president and commander in chief, a whole local government, you don't know whether it is from Borno or from Adamawa State. So, as a student of political science, we give we'll we'll respect to my professor, Hernan Blackbahis, who is by my side today, that politicians tend to engage in, in many games. Any disadvantage will be turned into their own advantage. We are used as a political scorecard. If we are not a strong political base to the incumbent administration, then your enemy will be killing your enemy as well, will be your business. But the most saddest thing is, they fought the life of our gallant men on danger. How many men and officers have we lost as a result of such type of complicity? Well trained, patriotic soldiers were lost. In a sort of warfare, you need a commensurate logistics and equipment. All the weapons that were given were not backed up by our nations. As a student of international security, if you give me general purpose machine gun or stinger or rocket propelled grenade or anti aircraft battery, I need the ammunition that correspond to the utilization and operation of the weapon that you have given me. All these high caliber weapons were there without corresponding ammunition. Once they come under the attacks of Boko Haram, they desert their stronghold and they leave this weaponry to the approaching Boko Haram. And why are they getting the ammunition to use it against the Nigerian military? So in 2012, 13, Maiduguri Metropolitan became itself under siege. All the roads leading to Metropolitan were blocked, except the way leading from Maiduguri to Kara. No electricity, no communication, no air flight. Our governors were even traveling by road and under constant attack by the Boko Haram. So if I were you, next year, I would have compiled the names of the gallant soldiers that lost their life. Most of the officers <coughs> and the names that lost their life in the Boko Haram as a result of state insensitivity. Alhamdulillah, in 2015, with the renewed commitment of this government, the military moved it is command and uh, it is command headquarters to Mayuri. They did a new leaf of support. Weapons were supplied. And the military had the gain. Just in less than two weeks, in less than two weeks, the military recaptured all the territory that they left hitherto to be controlled by the Boko Haram without the civilian joint task force. The most powerful military in Africa. Is it not a shock for you and I to hear that a whole Nigerian military will run down to seek for protection in Cameroon or in Chad? It's the greatest insult on our sovereignty. But Nigeria really resumed its leadership in Africa just in 2015. In less than two weeks, Boko Haram was defeated. I will not use the word degraded. Boko Haram was defeated. And in lecture, there are no hills. The hills are only in Goza. But the ongoing war against Boko Haram had completely changed its faces. There are international dimension of a rivalry between British and America on one hand against the French. <coughs> Le Chard is French's sphere of influence. Out of all of us, only Nigeria is Anglophone, British and American spies of influence. The France was battling for its influence in Chad, Cameroon, and in Nigeria. And since independence, France was looking at Nigeria as a rival used by British and America against the influence of the French. 
in the former French colonies. Again, the Chinese came up. The Chinese counterweighed the British, France, and Americans' economic influence in the Nectar region. China is now the number one trading partner of not only the Nectar region, but of the entire African continent. And above all, China owned most of the oil blocks in the Lecture. And that led to the re-emergence of Boko Haram with a sophisticated logistics and training. When they were defeated, where were they taken to? Nobody can tell you. If you control the satellite, you can travel the satellite, you cannot hear from me. But the recent abduction of the Chiba, where were they coming from? The attacks in Netele, they came through a helicopter. They didn't use anything. What is wrong with our air defense? Who was teleguiding them? Who is telling them the position of the Nigerian military and the proximity of the support? Whenever they are in need of a support, when they were under attack, they will tell them that if you are going to complete the operation from social media to social media, you are going to be successful. But if you delay, there will be another reinforcement. That is the statement that we are talking about. It has completely taken different dimension. People don't want to talk about it, but we are academics. We have to say the truth. And then you have the sort of, uh, you know, in, in security studies, they say when objects get old, they break. When institutions get old, they become corrupted. The logistics and the supply that is necessary for the Nigerian military was not there. Let me tell you frankly. The weapons that were supplied to the theater were not commissioned because Boko Haram is highly mobile and they are vulnerable. And the Nigerian military that were deployed there, they are not all that mobile as in case of Boko Haram. Two, they are not quick in intercepting intelligence because sometimes you have both electronic and human intelligence. You rely on human intelligence more than electronic or signal intelligence. But sometimes the intelligence that was relayed to the military by the population or the community will not be considered with utmost seriousness. Communities will be seen Boko Haram regrouping in order to strike. They will report to the military that don't worry, we are in the, on the top of the situation. Before you know, the community is already attacked and destroyed. Even in Medjugorje, you cannot go as far as five kilometers. You cannot. Tell anybody. You cannot go out for more than five kilometers outside Medjugorje. You will be attacked. People produce agricultural production. We have bamboo harvest. All these rice that were cultivated were second place. Beans and corns were second place by Boko Haram. So as a military, we have to engage in offensive, not to be on defensive, but you only offer be in offensive when you have the commensurate weapons. Thank you, it is a time, and I will leave you for further questions. Please, another round of applause for me. He, he, his, Dr. Mara has uh, kind of opened, opened up the space. Uh, you know, spoke to a number of the issues uh, that led to the start of Boko Haram and the situation we currently find ourselves in. I'll invite two other discussants to join us on stage and guided by the context he's provided, we will then explore or interrogate the current military approaches to winning this war. Permit me to invite Brigadier General Saleh Bala, retired. He's a retired Brigadier General of the Nigerian Army and currently the President of White Inc. Institute for Strategy, Education and Research. WISE, General Palaf. Diplomacy, Democracy and Development. A round of applause for the International I will join the panel and moderate the session. Um, I'd like to start with General uh, He's provided some context to 
the start of this crisis and how uh, the military and the Nigerian government responded at the start of the crisis that led to uh, the strengthening of the insurgency group. Um, can you, with your opening remarks, uh, speak to us to what the current military strategy is, you know, to defeat uh, uh, Boko Haram, and maybe talk a little bit as well as to your opinion on how effective that strategy has been. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Next Step, that out of the theming very brilliant Nigerians who like they typically are, always know what to do. That uh, you invited me to uh, speak. I am most humbled. The speaker has given a lot of background on the problem. And uh, I must congratulate you, uh, Professor, for as much as typical of the Nigerian character, we emotionalize a lot over our issues, and probably this is why our issues continue uh, uh, faster. I am also a strategist that is not given to conspiracy theories. The professor has put out a lot of assertions, which I will have to go back to my back channels and forward channels to verify. So I will not either mention or speak towards those issues. But what is consistent is this is a conflict that has gone long enough and has taken a lot of Nigerian resources and worst of all, Nigerian human beings. 10 years of an insurgency is a very brief while. Because as, just as I mentioned in another discussion on Friday, an insurgency never ends. An insurgency never ends. I always poke my fingers in the eyes of Nigerians. You know, when you go to fora like this, you never talk about religion. But I tell you, the idea of Christianity and Islam itself it's an insurgency. The more you persecute, the more you establish it. Nobody will ever be able to defeat Christianity and Islam for the life of that I know. So the more you repress and you use the instrument of state violence approach, the more you will increase the insurgency. It is easy to always hear that without peace there can be no development. So why don't we do why don't we lay development at the basis of it? If we are to speak to a military solution or to make an assessment of what the military is doing in the Northeast, I don't know what the military is doing in the Northeast. It is only from time to time where in the history of any insurgency anywhere that you have a military public relations person doing an engagement with the public. The military does not talk. The military fights. It is the Nigerian military that talks. I don't know what is happening in the Northeast. I left the military five years ago. I have smatterings of respect for people I can only engage on a personal basis. But it is not to say that I attain the rank of a brigadier general, I am dumb enough not to know things that are happening in the Northeast. The professor has spoken to a very defensive posture, which the military has. But I will quickly speak to what I know as someone trained by the US Special Forces and a qualified Green Beret that to fight an insurgency, because a counter-insurgency is fighting amongst the people. If you go and you read the little book with Mao Zedong wrote, 
When the military comes to fight a counterinsurgency, it adopts the police principle. The UNDP principle will tell you it is one policeman to 444 citizens. When we are fighting a counterinsurgency, it follows such ratio that it is 10 to 20 members of the forces to 25,000 citizens. So the whole of the Nigerian military easily tells you that they are in party whatever number of states. And the total number, declared number, of the Nigerian army or the armed forces in the total is about 320. Because the army itself is just about, it oscillates between 170,000 to 180,000. So if you are to commit that number alone to Borno, Adamawa, Yobi, Bauchi, and Gombe. What ratio of forces will you have to be able to fight the counterinsurgency? This is the big question. To fight a counterinsurgency, you have to also be amongst the people. And the counterinsurgency is a rural war. So our rural areas have to be saturated with forces. When we say forces, not just my friends in green. You have to also saturate your rural communities with intelligence agents. Not suit wearing, dark glasses, VIP, don't come close to my boss, clowns. You saturate the rural communities with highly trained and sophisticated operatives who gather information, who don't do not only gather information but have the capability to do strategic communications, to be able to communicate with the local community. And strategic communications is all about changing <coughs> behavior. So you fight on the kinetic and the soft platforms. It is a multi-sectoral, multi multidisciplinary, whole of government, whole of society approach. This is how counterinsurgencies are fought. And it, it counterinsurgencies as we have them today also follows a multinational, international approach. You cannot ban UNICEF. The banning of UNICEF it should be a political decision. It is not a military decision. You cannot ban UNICEF and then three hours later you unban them. So, but then I can understand that in Nigeria, the only tool we have of an organized institute is the military. So for every problem that we have looks like a nail. So the military is the hammer that we use to hit upon. I think I should stop here. Sure. So I can have another opportunity. Yeah. But before before I go to Lieutenant Colonel Flower, I just want to push you a little bit. Okay. Because you said, even as a brigadier general, retired just five years ago, you don't even know what the Nigerian military strategy is in the north. You also said that the military should not be revealing the strategy. If I heard you right. I would not say so. Because I know that every time the United States government or the UK government decides to move into Iraq or change leadership in Iraq, they state what the strategy is and the people have a chance to debate that strategy. Absolutely. Why is the Nigerian military strategy in the Northeast wrapped in a lot of secrets that even a retired brigadier general does not know what it is. It's an issue of culture. And it is an issue principally on the weak opportunist elements we have of our, as our political class. We have to vote in and have competent... They don't have to have degrees. I'm not one who believes our last attempt at the PhD, we all knew what it brought us. 
But the Sardonas of the past and a lot of lives that we have ended up in middle schools. We have to select the best to go into politics. It is not that riffraff at the at the corner of your of of your of your of uh, 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 of 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 your uh, of your street that becomes the chairman of a sensitive house committee that actually will call the service chief and pose him questions. I'm sure you've, you've watched congressional hearings and you've seen how senators pose questions to military officers. And also, a military officer is a public servant for God's sake. A, pub, a military officer is paid by the people. We must demystify our, our military. They are citizens. They are there to serve. The citizens must make the military to understand that wearing the uniform is a privilege. Excellent. So one of the first, in my view, conclusions we can reach in this conference is that there is a need for the military to share what the strategy is so that the rest of us can make input in that strategy. It is very important. Excellent. Especially in a counter in, in a, for a counterinsurgency, which is about which is also called fighting amongst the people. Because the people are the terrain. In a counterinsurgency, it is not like it is not about capturing ground. It is capturing the people. That's absolutely. So the people need to know what is there to, for them to be pro to protect them. Excellent. So let me move quickly to Lieutenant on the uh, lava. It is obvious that we are not winning the war on time for the ordinary Nigerian. What, in your view, are the challenges we have? Why the military cannot win a decisive victory and completely downgrade the capacities of Boko Haram in the Northeast? Thank you very much. <coughs> um, let me stand on existing protocol, as I always said, and go straight to the point. First and foremost, I think that um, the lead presenter, Professor, um, also joined Nigerians in committing one very important mistake. And what is the mistake? This war, insurgency, is ideological. It is ideological. And what do we mean? Ideological. It's not religious. I'm not talking about religious ideological. But the moment you have a group of people who have the idea that the present existing status quo must change, it is already ideological. They don't want government as established, and they want to install their own government. And it's a war of winning the hearts and minds of people. Otherwise, where did they get their uh, recruitment from? So basically, the error we make is that it is not ideological. I disagree. It is purely an ideological warfare. How insurgency is ideological. And what is insurgency, by the way? What do we mean by insurgency? By insurgency, we mean a person or a group of people who have decided to obstruct normal functions of government to obstruct social cohesion and to disrupt civil liberty. In some cases, any group of people or individual that take it upon themselves to obstruct normal function of government, the cohesion, social cohesion of the people, and limit civil liberty is already an insurgency. And he's pursuing an ideology of anarchy to transplant his ideology into the system of the people. And that's the first mistake we are making. And that's why, because we made that mistake, we push the military to go and fight it. The military does not fight insurgency. They fight terrorism. And there's a difference between insurgency and terrorism. Terrorism is a strategy of the weak to impose its will on the strong. And because government is stronger than these insurgents, they decide 
to impose terror. They attack, physical attack, all kinds of attack to impose their will. That's why the military comes in. The military comes in to remove terrorism. And it's a continuous thing. The Americans are still fighting terrorism, and yet they are still moving on. Uh, France, the Britain, all of them. So terrorism has become a phenomenon of a liberal democracy, and it will have to continue. But insurgency must be addressed properly, and the addressing counter insurgency is addressed by political will. It is done by politicians. And it is the politicians that will lead the way that will keep political goals to achieve. Therefore, if you say there is, for example, um, uh, social you know, uh, disorder, it's not the military. When you talk about sacking of uh, government funds, it's not the military. It's the government itself that must impose itself. Schools are not running. It's not the military that will go back and, and start to establish this school. Government will be determined. Political will be there to return people to the schools. And that brings me back to tasking the military. When you want to cast the military, you have to be specific. There must be specific goals for the military. Go and restore schools. Let it be there. So they go there to make sure that schools are functioning. Go and make sure that the roads are moving. They go there and, and make sure that that's the donors. So you, you cannot measure their sources. But when you just give them a blanket idea, go to the northeast and restore, restore peace. Go to the northeast and restore peace. That's, that's, that's the fruit, that's not the main thing. What you should actually be doing, the military should actually, the um, uh, political authority should actually be doing, is to set targets. I want my relative to read Bama Road open straight away. And all efforts by the military is to measure. That's where you measure the sources, and that's where you need to restore peace. You restore peace by, first of all, bringing back government functions. They must function. As long as they don't function, counter insurgency is not successful. I think these are the amazing things. First of all, political way must be there by tasking the military properly. They are not tasking the military properly, and that is why it is failing. It's failing because they are not being properly tasked by civil authority. They are asked the military to go. Just go there and uh, restore peace. Uh, and that's the food uh, issue. And let me come to the question of strategy. Mm -hmm. A researcher or a strategist does not necessarily have to get the book or ask the military where is your strategy. No, uh, journalists don't do that. What you simply do is to watch what is going on. You can discern their strategy from what is going on. And what is going on for the military as far as we are from the last 10 years is that of annihilation. Strategy of annihilation. Go there, look for their leaders and kill them. Go there, everywhere you find the terrorists, kill them. And that's what they have been doing. Annihilation, annihilation, annihilation. And this annihilation continues on and on and on and on. And what is the strategy of uh, the Boko Haram? Their strategy is very simple. Their own strategy is the operating cells. They are not in command structure. You can't find them, uh, they can't impose themselves as a target to anybody. They are in cells, small, small, small pockets of cells here and there with very strong communication. They communicate with themselves and able to group and isolate specific target, attack it, and disappear again. Therefore, you do not need so much of uh, physical structures to attack this group. You need intelligence. You need to be able to hit at their communication. You need to be able to hit at their cells. So that is just the way you begin to address this issue. Uh, and I said that the strategy of both parties the are very clear. It's very, very clear. Yeah. Who can Excellent. And let me come to Dr. Omara. Mr. Kona Bawa spoke to you know, the need for intelligence, especially in this counterinsurgency where there are no clear battle lines drawn. You also spoke about the civil uh, civilian JTF and the work they've done. How can the military work much closer with the civilian JTF to strengthen 
the local networks that can provide the intelligence uh, it requires to win this counterinsurgency war. Under the context of the baggage, the baggage that the military already carries as um, in this war of annihilation of just wherever they face the wipe it out, wherever they face the wipe it out, how can they rebuild trust to be able to build this intelligence network? Thank you so much. Before I proceed, I have to go back with due respect to the canon that um, the war is still not ideological. I was still in the my position. And that, that has been a distortion. The ideological inclination for the movement was accentuated as a result of the previous beginning. The Boko Haram is divided into two actually in the pro beginning. The ideological war were completely destroyed. And beneath it, I already said, is characterized by conspiracy and deceptions. I can tell you, many things of the same. But for the first, uh, for the second pillar, let me tell you that the Shekhar that we have been talking about was killed right in front of me, killed to the plate. And Shekhar was killed, was killed before Mohamed Yusuf. I'll repeat, Shekhar was killed before Mohamed Yusuf. So who's the who's the gentleman that the gentleman that keep on appearing on television? How many times was he killed by the Nigerian military? How many times was he killed by the Cameroonian military? How many times was he killed by the Nigerian authority and in charge? Tell me, you know it. So it's full of deception and consistency. That's the one thing that I want you to know. And Boko Haram is not ideological. Coming back to the question on intelligence. The military had been using intelligence and the approach of the military had completely changed. Today, the Nigerian military is completely part and parcel of the community. And they are working hand in hand with the people in the community. And the nature of their attack was before this administration. Because prior to that and prior to the pretty future, Apart from those that were deployed from the bush, even those from within the town, indiscriminately shoot. Many pregnancies were aborted. Many people died as a result of her attack, as a result of indiscriminate shooting without any warning. For many times, you can ask my professor here, for many times in the University of Mayuri, we were forced to run away as if it was Boko Haram that was coming. Just indiscriminate shooting that really triggered attention of many people. Many people died as a result of stomach heart attack and others as a result of that fear that people were perpetuated by the military. And as a result of that, they were completely resented. <coughs> but from but, 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 that world, there were no these type of shooting, number one. Number two, wherever they are deployed, they will first of all identify themselves with the community. And then number three, the community really see the military as their part and asset. In fact, apart from the civilian joint task force, even the people in the community do move in with the military to the bushes. And uh, people are talking about, uh, uh, is it uh, reintegration? The radicalization of reintegration. We have Operation Z Corridor. Do you know that? When Boko Haram wanted to surrender, do you know that it is the civilian jail transport that they will concern? Recently, just 11 of them went and surrendered. In Valley. And they asked those that were coming to Meduguri that we wanted to surrender, but we don't know how to surrender. But this way you go, you can convey that message to us. You know, when they related that information to the Nigerian military, the Nigerian military, you know, they are working hand in hand with the civilian joint transport. It is your own community who will give you the fire cover, then you go in it through. So the military supported the civilian JF, and then the civilian, civilian JF went there and they met them. They kept their weapons on one hand and they, they were on the other. So they were dropped down to Medjugorje and they were now taken to the rehabilitation centers. So these are these things that were happening not once, not twice. Every week we are being reporting this happen. So this is a sort of synergy between the civilian joint task force and the military. And even from the beginning, the Nigerian military had done a very wonderful job. You know, when the people felt that they had to defend themselves, when we took up arms, the military said, no, no, not everybody should check the arms. It is only people who are already screened by the Nigerian military. So for each sector, 
that was deployed by the Nigerian military also has its own sector. So for the first sector, if you have joint task force referring to the military, police, and others, then you have the civilian joint task force, which is attached to the particular sector. So it is the Nigerian military that give directives and the guidance to the civilian joint task force. And right now, as the ongoing the situation, the Nigerian military is moving alongside the civilian joint task force the local hackers and the vigilantes. So, and so intelligence is beginning to... In fact, we already have accurate intelligence. It is the failure to act upon the particular intelligence. I can concretely take you, give you three good instances. When, for instance, they were mobilizing to attack Kubio, the people came and informed the security that we have seen Boko Haram on They said they have no capacity to reach us. In the night they strike. The same thing happened in Gaza. The same thing recently along the line. So it is the failure to act upon the intelligence. So ever since the military started to engage with the civilians, the civilians feel much more free, the communities feel highly free, and they are interacting with the military, they are given the intelligence. But at the same time, you cannot blame the military for not acting because they are going to act based on what? Logistics. So if they are to act, we put it there, we put the logistics are able to act. If they are to move up, who is going to cover why they need? Who is going to make them the support? If on the other hand, their mission is to ambush them, if you move out and you are ambushed along the line, what are you going to do? Sometimes when you call for air support, the air support will also delay. Sometimes even the air support hit the friendly position, not the enemy position. So our soldiers, our military, in fact, they are one of the best. And I will always admit that the Nigerian armed forces remain the most powerful black force. But the nature of warfare need to change this strategy. And then lastly, to the Brigadier General, we don't need to unveil our strategy. Strategies are kept. It is only the action and the outcome of the strategies that will be seen. Once you unveil your strategy, that is why you are going to have the problem. And most of the problem that we have is the Nigerian police and the Nigerian military, as we say, are always coming out on the media to say, we are going to build this, we are going to deploy these weapons. Do you know that? Last week, Monday, I was in Damaku. I have seen my own brothers in the Nigerian military deployed to my people. I was in Damaku. The two trucks that is deploying them completely broke down. The two, two of the trucks. If they are attacked, with what are they going to do? Number two, on Tuesday again, when I was going to Mayuguri, I have seen their patrol gun pick up that uh, Toyota Hilux with the sub the general purpose machine gun that doesn't matter. But like it failed. They were pushing. We have to stop and help them. There must be political, even if you approve the supply of this weaponry and equipment, we need to supervise that appropriate weapon reach our men. They are our own brothers. They are our fellow Nigerians. They are by dying for us. They are dying for us. They are being killed. Go to the field, go to the theater, look at the state of their weapon, look at their welfare. They are dying. Excellent. Uh, moving on to the uh, Brigadier General, I'm sure you, you have a few responses to that, but add also, why is it that we can't solve this logistic and supply problem? It keeps coming up in all these discussions, and it seems like brain surgery, you know, like nuclear physics. You know, why is it that the military, the Nigerian military, which at the point was the strongest military in Africa, was feared in Sierra Leone and Liberia. What happened? That today it cannot prosecute a war in its backyard, but it went to Liberia and Sierra Leone and restored peace in what was a, a terrible conflict. Uh, there's just so much, so much to say um, within this short amount of time. Uh, my dear professor, there's not in the operational spectrum. The operational spectrum is broken into three parts. There is the strategic, there is the operational, and then there is the tactical. It is your operational and tactical plans that you do not reveal to the public. But the strategic declaration or the strategic proclamation 
is open. What more because a counterinsurgency is a multi-sectoral whole of government, whole of society approach. So you need everybody within that, that strategic environment to be aware of the overarching principle for which you are fighting. It is a national proclamation. That is why, for the for with due respect, I wish my brother Tumsa was around. You know, I tried to jab jokes at him. That is why the Buhari plan, that is very very contractual approach, uh, attractive, is there. Just to be able to see trucks will be supplied here, that will be done there. Even your counterinsurgency strategy is supposed to be like that, so that everybody can key in and see what it is. I, without uh, uh, blowing my trumpet, uh, I'm an almost graduate of the National War College of Washington, D.C., so I know very well who I am based, uh, from, the, from a professional perspective. But I will not believe all that. But I also find my professor being very, very convenient about uh, patronizing the military at one end, and then when it comes to a failure, he says security forces. You know, as Nigerians, we cannot solve our problems by just glossing over them and doing political correctness of that regime caused all our problems, and this regime is being sabotaged with all its good intentions. No! is a continuum. When there is a failure of the last government and you come in, you must own it and deal with it. I will not, Jonathan can go and fish. I don't have a problem with him. I will blame, look, of my 30 years of military service, 14 has been as an instructor. One of my students is sitting out there, he's a brigadier general already. So these are things that are very emotional to me. So I am the least person that is going to say bad about the military. Because the military gave me opportunities of two master's degrees and gave me the English I'm sitting here to speak. So I, these are kids that die every day. Sometimes they call me on their phones. Sir, you are there, you are in Abuja, and you can speak to them. I can't speak to anybody for God's sake. Let me not do the, continue with the emotionalizing as a typical Nigerian. What I think should be a national strategy, because I went to university in 1977 to 1981 to earn my degree in English. And I know full well that the wheat farms from Lake Chad came all the way to custom. You drive 10 kilometers out of Meiduguri, and there was wheat. My friend, Kalu, uh, Kalu, Kalu Oji, his mother sends him four trucks of palm oil every Thursday as a student. He sends her banga fish, four trucks. Meduguri youths who are rich young kids who go to Umrah and go to Hajj and marry four wives. It's prosperity that can deal with what we have. Boko Haram, as it is called, today started as a as a so no, no, it started as a socio-economic group yeah. where they distribute motorcycles, they train their wives on sewing yes. clothes, yeah. <laughs> ground pepper, that was what they were doing until the states said no you are we must be government. You cannot even 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 the so called Taliban they said we don't want to be in, in the cities. We go and set up our dad. And, and, and mind our own business until you send your police to go and attack them. So, but basically, if you ask me for the strategy, I'm giving this for free, I'm a consultant, that's what I feed myself on. What I would, what I would propose to LCDC is that what to do to deal with this counterinsurgency is recharging the lake chart. And then building on a military strategy that is about securing the recharging of the nature and rolling the aquatic and the agrarian lives of the people around the nature. If, look, the nature feeds seven countries. And if I mention all these countries, they are in strife. And you can trace it back to 
the degradation, the environmental degradation with, with the child. The people of Baga and all this, they were only dependent on their smuggling and what resources good comes out of the Lake Chad until we got into this problem. So a military strategy must be hinged on an economic strategy. If for the Northeast, it is about recharging and reviving the fisheries and farming around, around, around the Lake Chad, and the military should go do the business of securing the area and the communities around them. It's so simple, it's so difficult. Excellent. We'll, we'll come to some of those discussions in the second uh, session. Uh, Tumsa is not here, but his uh, carbon copy is here, who will be uh, uh, on that panel. But there's a point you raised the first time, which I want Lieutenant Colonel Flower to probably speak on before we go to the audience, because we can't have all these brilliant people and not tap into their minds. If we've got about 180,000 uh, military personnel for Nigeria's 36 plus uh, Abuja, and the way we pushed the military beyond just protecting the territorial integrity of Nigeria to almost doing policing work, there is an idea that is being fertilized that the civilian JTF should be converted into some kind of a reserve force. What are some of your thoughts on that, especially focusing on what the potential risk could be, so that we don't make a knee-jerk reaction of uh, civilianity has worked in this instance, we roll it out nationwide, and it becomes another problem. What are some of your thoughts on how to get the military to focus on what it should focus on, but have some alternative structure for dealing with you know, what lies between policing and uh, military operations. Thank you very much. <coughs> First and foremost, I think um, military deployment flows from strategy. And I want to say again that counter-insurgence it's not the main business of the military. It is the political uh, counter-insurgency is driven by politicians. And like you have said, military can be deployed for the purpose of development. Now, what you have, you are talking about pushing military on and on and on and on and on. How many soldiers are you going to deploy to cover the whole of the north? So that strategy is wrong. What we are saying, like the general is saying, is that you need special forces to address these issues, address the issue of intelligence. Know where they are, dedicate special forces to address those issues and put them in their cells. That's what we want. But for you to say, mass up military, mass them up, and go there, and when you see them, yes, they're all in law. It's a wrong strategy. And so it doesn't work that way. And because it does not work that way, we do not have this question of civilian GTF coming to, to, to fill the void and not the But I want to tell you, let me answer directly your question about civilian GTF. It's a time bomb. It's a time bomb that we are developing. First of all, these civilian GTF had their professions. Some of them teachers, they had got their professions and all that. If counter-insurgency were to work properly, they are supposed to go back to their normal work. Okay, schools have been sacked. Create schools immediately and let their teachers go there and teach them. So let those JTF be disbanded and go back to their normal work because they are creating a serious danger in the sense that once you have established that, they will not have this mentality of entitlement. Now we have done this, you will do this for us, and it becomes, you know, an apartment on the left of the government. And I think it's a very, very wrong trend. However, if you want to address the question of ungoverned species, then you need another paramilitary that can begin to do all this kind of work. The military should be reserved for the sovereignty and allow paramilitary to do its work. The police must be able to do their work. There's, uh, uh, mobile police be able to do their work, 
you need forestry, forestry guards, they should be there. Forestry guards are starting to fight here. Okay? Border communities need security. These are some of the things. And then you reinforce even the community-based security. It's also there. So there are so many, the whole national security architecture to be revisited. To make sure that different strata, you build different levels of security culminating into the military. Everything, everything, everything. You debate the system, you, 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 you don't professionalize them anymore, and so on and so forth. And so, for you to be able to cover ungoverned spaces, because that's the question. Yes. How to cover ungoverned spaces? We can cover ungoverned spaces by restructuring the national security architecture to make sure that different levels of security is established and they take care of their immediate community. Forestry guards must do their work. We uh, you know, uh, have military like uh, mobile police, must, even the police itself must be trained to do their work. Once all these people are in place, you have covered a lot of space. And so the national security architecture needs to be revisited. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mohamed, good luck. Can you come downstairs? Okay. Um, we're going to open it up for audience participation. Um, we just ask that you introduce yourself, uh, broadly in your organization, but keep the question to about 45 seconds. Good morning, everyone. I'm from the Australian Observed. My name is Nuruddin Tinyako. Chairman, Chief Executive Officer, Economics and Women's Support Foundation. It's an NGO that is focused more on empowerment and capacity building. And also, the Green Party gubernatorial candidate in the state, in the Falcon Division. My question, or rather, a straightforward observation goes to all members of the panel and the high table. If you are thinking about um, terrorism or insurgency, obviously we cannot remove economics from the whole picture. Conflict, resource-based conflict, unemployment, lack of opportunities, inequality, poverty, illiteracy, all these factors contribute to what we are seeing in the North. They will appoint us before this thing escalated, all the records and statistics are showing us that something is coming. Hi, you may or no, I don't know state, or the North East particularly, are among the most poorest regions or states in the country, with highest illiteracy level and highest youth unemployment. What do you expect them to do at the end of the day? Do they have opportunity to get 5,000, 10,000 to go and uh, perform at hand? This is what this boy is going to be paid. In Adama recently, there's a group that is also going on. And most likely, if something serious is not being done, they're going to be transformed to something similar to Boko Haram in the future. Sure. The numbers are increasing. In Taraba, there's such group. In Bochi, in Gombe. So we cannot separate the economics from the whole thing. We have to look at climate change, we have to look at energy, we have to look at opportunities, we have to look at education. What is the voluntary allocation of education? in the North Eastern state. I think there's something about it. What is the federal government doing about? Is Empower enough to employ over 10 million youths in the North East that are within 15 to 35 days? Over 10 million? How do you solve that problem? We have to look at it from a holistic perspective. The second observation is the involvement of the society in general. All the demographies must be involved. Religious leaders, community leaders, youth organizations, women organizations, they must all be involved. I expect to see some of them here. Unfortunately, we hear from them. Sure. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just quickly respond to that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Oke okay, Ikechiko MNI, <laughs> Senior Fellow in UC Business School and Executive Director of Development Specs Academy. About three months ago, we were in my degree to organize a training for all the spokespersons of the um, security agencies and, and services. A few things in mind. The first is that the war is asymmetrical. I will have a military and security establishment that's trained to be able to identify the target. That's one. Two, the other point arising from the debate is that we've been told that the engagement in Boko Haram is not ideological. I take a different view for a simple reason. The, the, the first speaker's approach is a historical, very informative and correct, close to 98% from my 
uh, understanding of the issues. But two points are clear. The first is that in a war, you know, Boko Haram exists to become an alternative to the Nigerian state. True or false? Both, ladies and gentlemen. To that extent, it's a clear theological position that says, no, what you need for, I wouldn't accept. That provides the clear basis for the fanaticism, the certainty, the determination, and the rest of it. And I think it's an element we need to insist upon. I'll end on a simple note. The Northeast no longer exists as a living state. The local economies have collapsed. Do I have to drop the mic? Okay. The local economies have collapsed. The light that used to be there is no longer there. The child is receding. But you find that in all the approaches being adopted, the focus is on um, the, one of the military officers used the word annihilation. They are dealing with the physical space, forgetting that the human component of what used to be the northeast has been dramatically violated. The sense of community no longer exists. Those who used to farm wheat, sugar cane, dates farm, and the rest of it doesn't happen. Redesertification has occurred in most of the places that were taken over, and it will require close to seven years to make them arable land again. So the approach, whether of the present or previous government, is shortcomings in focus, in budgeting, in the attitude of those managing it, and even in the approaches to military engagement. In an environment that's overtaken by asymmetrical engagements at all levels, communication, livelihoods, etc., there is now a Russian mentality in the Northeast. Unfortunately, most of the approaches being designed and implemented are also Russian focused. That cannot be sustainable. And the truth of the matter, a final note, is that the Boko Haram insurgency has become part of the physical and human geography of that place. It's no longer a matter of what the military is doing or is not doing. We must adopt a 20-year perspective. And like I said, the decision has been made between tactics and strategy. In the short term, within the next one year, what should we focus on? If it's on reclaiming the physical space, what number of military personnel do we need to manage? What volume of logistics? So the ad hoc engagements and the celebration of accidental victories I think we should go beyond that. Thank you. Uh, I give you a suggestion from General Balab, recharging Lake Chad. It's obviously a good one, and the President has also been making that suggestion uh, repeatedly and skill support. But we have to be realistic and look at the feasibility. First issue. Uh, this water interbasin transfers from Ubangi River in Central African Republic. That river has lost 30% of its volume. Second issue, South Africa has put money on the ground that Central Africa should dam the Ubangi River and it will guarantee to buy all the electricity because it has an electricity crisis. Third issue, that dam cannot be built because the state in Central Africa controls only 20% of its territory. All the country is in the hands of insurgents. So we can't just be giving ourselves easy solutions, just bring in the water. There's no water to be brought in. Now, from the Nigerian end, have we really studied the issue? Two sources of river go to the chart from Nigeria. One is Kano River. There are two dams in Kano that block the water from going to Yobe and Borno, in Bochi, what's the name of this Bochi? Yeah, yeah, it's also down. So we have a situation where we are not doing our own homework. Bochi and Kano states are blocking all the water going to that part of the country and intensifying the uh, crisis. Why are we not talking about our own internal responsibilities in, in terms of recharging the River. So it's very easy to say, okay, we just bring water from Central Africa. When that water, we know, at least in the next 50 years, it's not going to happen, even if you actually get the money for the entire basin water transfer. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's take a bit of security and fragility for conflict management consulting.
my question to Brady Debala and the professor is on the issue of uh, military accountability. Uh, an obvious uh, thing in this room is that our military is not accountable. How can we get our parliament, because this is the case of the National Assembly, how can we get our parliament to make our military more accountable? This question is premised on the fact that the world over, militaries that are accountable are more effective in the field and in, in delivering results to their, to their country. So in, in Nigeria, how can we get our military to be more accountable sure. to the parliament and to the people? Th thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Shikima Ali, and I'm the Managing Director of Samori Bele Memorial Foundation. Um, my role is actually an observation. Um, I think Dr. Bala and uh, several of the speakers have raised or have brought in this issue whether Boko Haram is actually an insurgency or it's a terrorist organization. Doesn't make any difference actually when Boko Haram actually you know, terrorizes in, you know, innocent people. They come in when people are sleeping and then attack the innocent, not the soldiers, not public, you know, administrators and so on and so forth, just the ordinary people and kill them and go away. Does it matter whether they are insurgents or actually they are terrorists as far as I'm concerned, actually they are terrorists. Number two, you know, we are actually looking at the situation. Now the whole of the North East is actually in a dire spring. You know, nothing works. It particularly in Borno State. There are so many places that you actually don't even have a semblance of government there. And almost all the villagers have shifted either to you know, Medjugorje or they have moved elsewhere. Now, how can you now you know, say that it is a political assignment or a political you know, thing or, or is it responsibility of politicians actually you know, to get it to fight the, the insurgency as you call it and bring back normal situation. One, I think you have to remember that the Boko Haram actually the, it was started and funded and supported by the politicians who actually were looking for cheap you know, support of people and so therefore they condoned all the actions of the Boko Haram people when it's, it was just starting you know, as at that particular point in time. It was only when it was getting out of hand that the, uh, um, President Yerado has said then brought in the military, you know, to quash the, you know, the Boko Haram. So how can you actually now come and say or convince us that, you know, it is an insurgency and so therefore it is the job of the politicians to get it right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm Colonel Major Retires, uh, Research Fellow National Defense College. Um, I just want to ask some question. What is the Nigeria's strategic intent on uh, Boko Haram? Because we keep on hearing dissemination, defeat, or domination. Then, but we must get the strategic objective very clear. And also because insurgency war is a, dy a dynamic one. And we must be futuristic in our strategic plan. And as such, I would suggest there should be an effective security sector reform. Because if you have a military, just a military line of action, you have some other security agencies, you have some civil society organizations, some NGOs that must be, uh, be doing their own part. The judiciary, the National Assembly, the politicians, they must be doing their part. So if you have a sort of very clear directives on the, the security sector, so there should be a a pragmatic security sector reform in the country. Because we know the policemen, they have a place to do the border management, the customs, immigration, and so on. Because all those are government spaces. There should be some people taking care of uh, such uh, areas. The legislators, the local government, everything, if it's in place, all this problem will seriously be reduced. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been very interesting to listen to what a lot of people are saying, but it's obvious that a lot of us are just being very sentimental and not, and not really openly objective. And uh, I think the challenge we've had in the Northeast and in the entire theater of oppression is the Nigerian government has maintained a constant narrative. The Boko Haram narrative itself has changed. Prior to 2009, everybody who joined the movement joined because of religious conviction. From 2009 to today, People have joined our movement for different things, and some of these are what people have talked about. 
And I think one thing we're doing is that we're looking for a short-term solution to a long-term problem. And the civilian JTF is one of such. The civilian JTF is the next challenge, not just of the Northeast, but the entire nation. When you have people that are legitimate arm carriers, carriers bought by taxpayers' money, that don't have a platform, it's not a structured institution to do that. It's a problem we need to face in the next five years. And now, in the Northeast, that is already happening. So we need to start thinking, apart from dealing with Boko Haram, looking at what do we do to reintegrate and work on the concept of the civilian JTF itself. Because it is something that has come up from what has been endemic in the culture of the North. People who use amulet arm, they have solved a problem at the moment, but they have a problem for the future. And the other thing, again, is uh, the military itself is looking at it from the perspective of counterterrorism. And just like one of you have said, there is nowhere on earth where we've had terrorism, where we have insurgency that has ended completely. So what do we need to do? The military need to start looking, thinking outside of the box. They should come up with a new dimension of what we call inclusive security. Everybody has a role to play in a system that is bedeviled by things that are not secured. So the concept of shared and inclusive security is going back to the system. What is the culture saying? What are the values of the people? What do they hold so there? How do we integrate that in the security architecture? Then we move forward. There is a role the security military will play. We cannot run away from it. But when it comes to strategic communication, counter-narrative, counter-terrorism, there is a role that the entire civil society needs to play. Not politicians, the entire civil society and the civil society space. And the challenge the military has had at first is, right now, the Nigerian army is not as bad as we think they are, but they are the most disrespected in the entire world. They live too long in the civil society. They've lived too long in communities that have had ordinary border classes, and they have refused to leave. Because most of this violence that happened, most of this conflict have become an ATM, and everybody benefits from it, especially those who are supposed to protect us. So they're not interested in going back to the barracks. So the, so the society, the civil population, we don't trust them again. By the time you bring them to the community, when you are rotating and they're going, 17 girls are pregnant. Our girlfriends have been taken off. <laughs> a lot of things are happening that we should be So we no longer respect them. So there needs to be the system of community cohesion, where people in communities, structures of community, are being embarked in the entire security architecture. And we look at, this is the borderline, this is where they should be, and this is where they should not go. Unless we do that, we will still be messing up the regard and the respect we have to the camouflage and the green color, so that people will do other things. And let's not forget, in the concept where we have terrorism, ideology plays a role, and there's a difference between fundamentalism and fanaticism. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, my name is Kazim Sanusi, um, development expert, and I do a bit of thinking on situational intelligence. I look at the great, uh, I start on existing protocols. Um, I'm impressed at the level of discourse that has been happening here. It shows that people are thinking about this from different perspectives. And I want to point out something that um, I think that we should begin to look at. There is a lot of intellectual gap in the uh, insurgency situation that we have. We don't have an alignment of interest and alignment of opinion. So everyone is talking from his perspective, his own point of interpretation of what is happening, we should have a singular story, a single idea, a single perspective, and this requires a lot of social re-engineering, a lot of give and take in opinion, changing positions and changing um, uh, food stands to know that this is a single battle. We have a single destiny and a single um, point we're going. So with that intellectual gap in place, if we don't solve it, we're not going to solve this problem. If we don't have a single like, single opinion, single thought that this is not right and it should be countered and everybody comes to the table to put their hands together and everyone walks towards a single objective, we're not going to solve it. People talk from different perspectives, they have different interpretations. Now, there is a reason why consultants solve problems, because they are not in the eye of the storm. The military, the government, the politicians, 
they are in the eye of the storm. They are under pressure to solve this problem. You cannot solve it because intellectually you are overburdened with that pressure of solving the problem. We must consult our way out of this. We start with aligning, with getting all the facts, making a sense of it, looking at the dynamics and beginning to project where are we coming from, where are we going, where are we today. Those are the things, the kind of exercises that I expect that Nigeria should be doing now. Sure. And it's not a military affair, it's not a politician affair. It is a, it's a mindset that we're consulting our way out of this challenge. Excellent. Thank you very much. We can hold on to the microphone. We'll do that one. Um, but I think we should come back here and you know get some responses uh, to what we raised. Um, some of them were directed at you. Um, let me just add one. The one from OKH group on asymmetric warfare and an approach of government being shut down. If you can also speak to that, that if we are indeed in an asymmetric war. What should we, how should we be prosecuted? And how do we get a, a government that has a four year, a guaranteed four year term to think long term in, to, to this future? Uh, again, I'll start by saying so much things to say. I will get to Dr. Okechi, who, who I agree with completely. That we have to have a broad spectrum plan. That is, that is even judifiable, which makes it compulsory for succeeding governments to stick to. You know, I am one who, who for one thing I agree with Jonathan is that we should have a seven one year tenure for any administration. This four years thing is too short and it hampers us a lot. But not to belabor the point, I think we should have a broad spectrum plan like we used to have a national development plan, like the Abacha Vision 2020 that was convenient to throw around, to throw away, because it was Jonathan. So do we have to have a campaign plan? Like the, the general will tell you, once a minute, once you get a political directive, you sit down and you design a campaign plan. And the campaign plan is sequenced to several levels of action, and it gives you alternatives. It gives you nodal and terminal points. If we get here, this operation ends because it, because it helps to achieve this. If there is a failure, we take off also this line of operation. That has to be very, very clear. But I will always agree, like I agree with the presidential initiative of the, of the Northeast strategy, which has been conveniently called the Buhari plan now, that if we look at that, that is a framework on which to start from. It enables us, us to review it over time and enrich it and have a platform on which we can counter this insurgency we have in our hands. I want to thank Kazim Sanusi for speaking on behalf of Think Tanks. <laughs> think Tanks are uninvolved detached people for as much as we can be framed as agents of uh, so, so, so country and so, so country. But while that, of course, sometimes exists, but from a patriotic sense, that, are, that we are awash with people who are outside the conflict and who have gained experience over the years in various sectors, who without any pressure can advise on how to improve things. It's free, it's out there for all of us. CJTF, I really don't see I am not one who is so pessimistic about CJTF being the next problem. I think the problem of CJTF being the next problem has been solved at the point we all agree that it is the next problem and we start to deal with it. The French resistance was never a problem after the World War. Never. Go to the history. Mao Zedong, when he prosecuted his revolution, the people he brought back well, I'm entrenched in what, was, what is happening. The party is still there in the huge hall where the old people sit in front and the younger ones are learning. I'm not a communist, but it is a human system that is working. That's why every door in Nigeria now is now a Chinese door. That's why every beautiful woman wearing a brocade is a Chinese brocade. That's the way it goes. 
and to speak, to plug into the Nureli Nyapo, which also talks about a grand plan. The Marshall Plan is not end power. It's not going into the market to give market women 10 naira. A Marshall Plan is a Marshall Plan, which Nigeria doesn't. So for as long as you are thinking about Kekena Pep, which is problem, which give, and your uh, and your wife is going to bring 40 food containers of hairdressing uh, 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 things from China and distributing to our mothers who will kneel down before a 25 year old wife of yours to collect and thank her with a bag of rice. You are not dealing with the problem. We must have an industrial plan. And that is why my, my, my beloved uh, uh, older brother, Dr. Jibril, I'm talking about the charging the big child. There's no going back about that. I, I, am, I have read it well, and you have added more belief to me that we have to find an internal solution. A strategist does not look at one way. I never believe in dredging what some funny river from Congo and recharging. But I know that we must, we must do something about the receding of child if we are to deal with the problem of the Northeast. How it is done is not by a presidential convenient declaration in Switzerland or Poland or the convenience of speaking abroad to your people. It is about dealing with the problem. It is about the strategic discussion on how we must, even if it, every Nigerian, 180 million Nigerians, have to take a pocket to be child. <laughs> we have to do it. Uh, quickly, military accountability. The military can only be accountable if you stop fearing them. If you stop fearing the military, Insurgency is war of hearts and mind. That's insurgency. Hearts and mind. They attack your heart and mind to make sure that you do not function with government and that your social cohesion is disrupted. That is insurgency. Terrorism is about shooting. It's about physical force. And so you can have insurgency without even the shooting is what going on. And I'll give you an example. If an insurgent tells a community, don't go to farm, 
don't, do not go to that farm. If you go to that farm, something will happen to you, and they do not go to farm. Actually, insurgency has taken place. So as long as government does not function, social vision is distorted, and there's a lack of civil liberty, insurgency is taking place. And they do it. And let me tell you about propaganda. Propaganda of uh, insurgency is the one attack the military and humiliate them somewhere and go to another place and tell them that the military cannot help you. So there's difference. And until this heart and mind is addressed, until you are able to convince, because they have delegitimized government. The purpose is to delegitimize government and implant their own system. That's exactly what the soldier says. And so, unless you are able to counter the narrative, like somebody said, we are not even countering any narrative. What we are doing so far is doing terrorism and mitigating the damages of terrorism. The actual counterinsurgency, where you will restore civil liberty, where you will restore all other functional activities, including social cooperation, has not yet been done. It has not been done yet. We are still fighting terrorism and mitigating its effects. We must go back to actually work on countering insurgency by restoring all those functional things. As long as it's not functioning, it, you have not done any, anything yet. Secondly, about military accountability. The general has um, said one or two things, but I want to add very, very crucial points about the theoretical underpinning of uh, military accountability. And that is that if the principal has no way of controlling his agent, the agent will do whatever he will. Therefore, it behooves on the principal to be able to control his agent. And I can tell you that the principal, that is uh, government, politicians, are not able to control the military, and that's what's going on. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. If you read the um, Terrorism Anti-Terrorism Act, Anti-Terrorism Act, if you read it, it contains a lot of liberty. It is done by, by, by Act of Parliament. The Act of Parliament has empowered the military to do so many things under the Act the Terrorism Act. It can, it can detain you without question. They can arrogate anything to themselves. So you must, the civil liberty that is being curtailed by the military is even inherent by the laws uh, you have made by yourself. And these are the areas you must address. If you don't address these areas of curtailment of civil liberty, and you don't address excessive you know, uh, authority to the, the military, as you can find in the Anti-Terrorism Act, we are going to have a lot of challenges. And the military man can simply say, what you are gathering here is uh, amounts to insurgency, and you, are, you get arrested. And the Ministry of Justice, the judiciary, have no oversight function over some of these activities. I want to tell you, there's no, there's no basis for the military having detention camps, running detention camps. It is not their, their, their responsibility. It's hand over to um, either the Ministry of Justice or the prison services and so on and so forth. And then they should have oversight. But when they abdicate their responsibility, of course, discretionary powers set in. And when discretionary powers set in, it has no end. So the principal must be able to control his agents. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's take a final comments from uh, Dr. Omar and who wrap up this session. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, all the observations that I made are not too valuable, but I wanted to really draw the attention on the issues of the challenge of Chad. You see, uh, the Ubangi River that was proposed to be channeled to uh, support the Shari and the Mogoli River in the Central African Republic, that is the 30 percent of it have been drained, is also going to divert from the Congo rivers. And the government had really consulted the government of these two countries, the Congo Democratic, uh, Democratic Republic and the Republic, uh, uh, and then the Republic of Congo, Congo Brazzaville. And uh, the tenants, they had the sort of strategic people in Any time during the rainy season, most of the towns around the Congo River are irrigated with water. They were looking for a way out to divert the rivers. 
And the Nigerians concerted effort by bringing Ikuko was they accepted to be part of the Nigerian Commission as an observer. And for the money that was paid by South Africa uh, to engage in hydroelectric power generation, that was part of the strategy of the intervention water transfer because they had to action. One is to get the water diverted through the tunnel by digging in the hills of the Ituri. And then the other is to construct 300 kilometer canal. The 300 kilometer canal will now be able to central Africa public, not only to irrigate, but to generate power that will be supplying not only Central Africa and Cameroon, even some of the powers to resort to some parts of Central Africa and West Africa, so which was already after two by the regimes in the Central African uh, Republic. Besides that, navigating down to the Kongona River, the Upper Benway and Lower Benway, up to Calabar, navigating down to the Chad. This is why they invited Okna by uh, constructing the canal. So after the consultations by the Chad Basin Commission, United Nations Environmental Program and World Wildlife Fund, uh, we had the ambassadors of India and China that successfully came down to Maiduguri. In China, the discoveries of the Chinese uh, geologists, particularly the hydrologists, the groundwater experts, they said Maiduguri was sitting on the water. I cannot call the cable data that they talk about. They say even if Maiduguri would house 150 million people, the groundwater of Maiduguri will sustain the city for additional 150 years. Why can't you utilize the water to engage in irrigation agriculture than to wait for the recharging of the lake charge? For the the the, 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 the rivers in Kano that flows through to Yeza, the dam of Chalawa gorges that drain the Gashua, the Gasma, the Nuru, the uh, substantial part of the area and that to northern Bono, there was a movement that I created particularly the people of Bono, who are in the downstream sector and those of your estate. So the dam really drained the waters. And then as a result of that, we were liaising with the people of Kano. The dam did not only reduce the water flow, rather, without informing the people of the dam flow, they just released the water. And the water would just destroy all the crops that were already produced. So for now, the water was not even coming through Kano. What we had now is only Hadeja Jamare water which dam was attempted to construct a dam to produce sugar cane in order to process sugar. And that created very much tension between Borno and Yogi on one hand as against the Bauchi state government. And it was carefully handled by the Jonathan's regime. When Dan Bauchi and the then governor of Bauchi insisted, they said even in Bauchi, someone like Hadeja would so have Farming activities along the Hadeja Jamara River by Bochi State is not even significant. Significant percent will be affecting the people of Yomi and uh, Borno State. So it was almost about to generate ethnic crisis between the Kanuis on one hand and the House of on the other. And the success uh, are the, the problem are the Hausa people. Yeah, no, 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 no. Hausa plan you can be all these are the same people. So now what really started was the government was careful in way. So the governor opted by asking Dan Boche to suspend the construction of that along the fringes of the river and then move down to Savannah in Adamal State. So now for the recharge. Up to now, whether with the water in the chart or without the water in the chart, there are huge water reserves beneath the chart. And as the general suggested, there are very many ways that were presented by the Pakistanis, by the Indians, and by the Chinese. And if we can harness that, we'll do that. Sure. But again, the issues of insurgency, which was already tired to be receiving of the child, I think is not going to be consistent with the issue. Saying that insurgency, commensurate with poverty, with unemployment and others, throughout history, the people of the Northeast were not employees of the government or factory employers. They were people who aimed their means of livelihood through agricultural production and exchange of commodities. The greater thing now is for us to attain the stability. 
when the stability is going to look at the overall aspect. If you contain Boko Haram, what about the uh, Antibalanka and the Selika in the Central Africa region? What about the uh, intra rahamwe militia in the Democratic Republic of Congo? What about the ninjas and cobras in the Central African Republic? And above all, the issues of the water transfer plan was dissented by the proclamation that was made by the United Nations Environmental Fund that if the waters, either through getting to, uh, to transfer or by constructing the dam, there are alien species from the Congo River that will move down to the Lake Chad. And then the flow of these diseases such as Ebola, and then the cross-border weapons and militia movement will now proliferate. There, there, are, there are no easy solutions. Yes. <laughs> but, but there are solutions. The solution is only uh, for the areas to be secure, to empower the people to go back to their respective communities. That is only one. Last, which was not already discussed, sorry for taking your time, I don't agree with ungovernable space. Our spaces are governed. Rather, the modern political structure of governance, it must be related to the existing institutions that control these territories. We have emirates, we have empires. We have the areas, we have the shadows. They have a sophisticated political structure that stems from the bottom to top. If these people are not carrying along whatever level of strategy that is being built toward really peace, in fact, the modern governance cannot do. Lastly, again, the area that was liberated by the military should be opened up for the civilians to move in. When the civilians move in a relatively larger area that has some water and other things with a traditional ruler, and if this traditional institution will be backed by the force, there will be a liaison between community A and community B to be monitoring their areas in order to support the military's operation. Sure. But in a situation where the communities are dislocated, Nganze, Kukawa and Guzamala, these three local governments, that is my letter, like, is as big as the southeastern states. Don't hesitate, please. Let us be delayed. Don't no, hesitate. We, we, we will discuss this now, in the second I, session. I'm talking about the development of the military that we are talking about. Now, the military deployment, even if you increase the number, unless and until you increase the traditional institution's participation, by making the people to have a say, by making the people to police their respective communities, in fact, that issue of giving us idea in Abuja, where you don't even know what is going on in the ground, I think will not work. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. A lot has been discussed. I was about to summarize them, but I think the panel has done justice to that. Um, we will take a 15 minute stretch break, a 15 minute stretch break, and then come back in for the second session. And the second session will lead with a presentation by Professor Aruna. I'm really excited to listen to that. And then a panel discussion. We will definitely end that session by 2 o'clock with lunch. Excellent. Welcome back. I'm sure uh, our other colleagues will join us in a little bit. So, having completed the first session, which is on winning the peace, uh, interrogating Nigeria's approach to the Northeast conflict, we're moving quickly to the second session, which is on rebuilding lives. And for that session, we'll have Professor Haruna. Lapa um, to present a paper uh, titled Rebuilding Lives Navigating the Tides of Desolated uh, Communities in the Northeast Nigeria. Please a round of applause as Prof comes to the stage. This is a moderator, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I have the misfortune of speaking after a robust session. And the disadvantage of that is that what has been scripted may be very stale at this moment, <laughs> simply because the others that spoke before now had preempted most of the paper's content. However, I understand that next year send the paper to each person through your email boxes, and with that, 
I don't need to bore you going sequentially as the paper was written. I will rather pick randomly at the issues that have not properly been discussed to share my own opinion on it and elicit probably responses from you. The paper is on rebuilding uh, lives in the desolated areas in the northeast. What does that imply? In the main paper, I decided to discuss the issue that seemed to have been raising the concern over how government and security agencies have been handling the Boko Haram crisis and the standard that has been generated, especially over the claim that the Boko Haram terrorists have been defeated. And with that, the statement looks like there is a disconnect between the official government sites and the communities that are affected directly by the counter-terrorism and counter-insurgency program. Part of the paper gave details of the consequences of the Boko Haram, the IDPs generated, the dislocation of communities, and the integration of families and relations, as well as the social, economic, and political consequences of the disturbances. Well, it has been highlighted in details, even with some tables that I don't think we should go through. But the summary of it is, we are dealing with communities that are highly devastated, scattered and shattered, whose members cannot even know where the others are living. Some, as we speak today, they don't know whether some of their relations are still alive or dead. And these are communities that have lost their own communities in terms of social network, as well as physical domain of existence. And paradoxically, although some of the traditional title holders in these communities are still holding on to their titles, they have been technically dethroned. Why? Because the basic requirement of a traditional ruler is to have a domain to rule over, which consists of a geographical territory over which their own jurisdiction can be determined. And then they also need people over whom they should rule. Unfortunately for the Northeast people, not only are the traditional rulers dispossessed of their own thrones from their own stools or traditional homelands, but they have been forced to relocate and live in the domain of others. Specifically speaking, in Borno State, five first-class areas have relocated to Maiduguri, the state capital where the Shebu reigns. Unfortunately, some of their population follow them to Maiduguri when they are in IDP camps. Others are scattered all over the Northeast and even to the neighboring countries. So, functionally, how do you call such a person, a traditional ruler, without somebody who he could rule over within a defined territory that belongs to that stool. And economically, Professor Omara had talked about some of the damages done to the communities paraphernalia. But the paper gave some reports which were produced by the USAID and some other researchers that indicate that especially the lecture zone. The people have been chased away, their economy has been confiscated or destroyed. 
and they have relocated in places they cannot have meaningful economic engagement. Because of this, poverty is so endemic. Rather than see the Boko Haram issue from the economic factor as a cause, I would rather see it from the economic deprivation and difficulties created by Boko Haram as a consequence. And these are very fundamental in respect of how we go about rebuilding the societies and bringing back to the, the people to normalcy. So these social, political, and economic factors have given us an impression that these communities are really still suffering on a high level. However, the deadlock that we are going to examine is the interpretation of the situation from different angles. On the part of the government, to them, especially under the euphoria that a gentleman, highly trusted and tested, very uncorruptible president had come into power since 2015. Anything spoken by somebody with high integrity may qualify to be a gospel truth. And the president has spoken that by 2016, towards 2017, Boko Haram has been defeated technically. They have been thoroughly degraded, or they have at least been reduced to only attacking on soft targets. Because of this, confidence and optimism that is given to us from the top. I can sympathize with the military because they cannot say no. Their position is so difficult that even if they know that things are not as cozy as portrayed professionally, as a political elite, they are to keep quiet. And because of this, especially the top notch of the military, seem to even exaggerate the picture that Boko Haram is just a shadow of itself. And based on what the politicians say and the military officers follow in choruses, there is a kind of assumption that these communities are safe enough for the people who were dislocated initially to be called back to continue with their lives with small or minimal improvement in their own physical environment. And therefore, the DDRRR program was started in Annex. This has given the impression that if you can reconstruct few houses that you are going to be damaged, you can clear the roads that lead to those communities, and you can send humanitarian aid in terms of food and not food materials to this community, bounce back to their normalcy. From my own interpretation, this is the wrong premise. It is unrealistic and it may not be workable unless there is a serious committed strategy developed to ensure that where we feel that there is safety and security, it is not only in proclamation but in actuality. And not only that, the government also had subsidized the international community which led to the creation of the Nigeria Humanitarian Fund, which also led to the Oslo Summit in 2016, and then followed up in various other places. The international community has done its best. It has generated, at least in terms of pledges, up to $1.05 billion. <coughs> At the home front, Nigeria has created interagency committees, 
threat to stop agencies also to engage in humanitarian activities. And therefore, it is believed that with this robust infrastructure for humanitarian intervention, and with the rebuilding of the societies, complemented by some strategies adopted by international NGOs, local NGOs, UN agencies, and other humanitarian groups. These communities are, are supposed to be rebuilt and be conducive for human existence. However, these activities, whether from the optimism of the government or the security or the engagement of humanitarian agencies, is also suffering one problem, politics. The humanitarian agencies are willing and eager to intervene, but the manner in which they want to intervene sends out signals to the politicians on the ground who do not intervene any activity of government outside the portion that will go to their private pockets. And they hold these international agencies sometimes in high degree of suspicion. Even to the extent of alleging that some of them actually collaborate with the insurgents so that they can do needs assessment directly and physically and authentically. But in such demand, the government in power are saying, look, these are a bunch of spies who are there to infiltrate society, align with the insurgents, and probably prolong the insurgency. And this is part of the conspiracy theory that some people are actually conflict entrepreneurs, and the longer the problem lives, the more they are pleased by it, and the richer they become. <coughs> On the part of the humanitarian agencies also, there is modicum of suspicion of the Nigerian politicians or indigenous government or organizations in the sense that a lot of them would like to deal directly with the people in distress rather than channeling their own contributions through government or quasi-government agencies because of the media hype that tend to portray that every Nigerian is a potential thief. And if you give him 1,000 naira to send it to somebody in the IDP, he will take 70 kobo. I mean, some, uh, 700 out of 1,000. And the remaining 300 will still trickle down to some parasites in government and before it reaches the actual target community or individuals, it may be less than 100 naira. So to be on the safe side, they rather deal directly with the people and deliver issues or materials to them. And this type of suspicion is extended even to Nigerian agencies, including the Victim Support Fund, the BEC, uh, NI, etc. Because I certainly watch them going to communities presiding over the delivery of roofing sheets, building materials, cuttings and holes and etc. I thought that is so mundane that it could be handled by even the CSO at the grassroots level. So I've given all this boring background to create the impression that it is not yet Uhuru. The communities are not yet safe. We are not talking in terms of unison in our approach to the problem. And our own approach is characterized by mutual suspicion and lack of trust. <coughs> Against this background, therefore, I argue that all the efforts that the government is doing now, complemented by international organizations, are uh, okay in terms of principles, but they need to be reformed because the language spoken by
by the official quota is different from the pains and difficulties that these communities that are desolated experience on a daily basis. And uh, from there, at the back of my argument, I gave the impression that this so-called diminished or thoroughly weakened Boko Haram is still very active in some communities. And although the military might define what they do as attack on soft targets, to the ordinary person in the communities, it means a lot. Because at every attack, not only are people physically assaulted, killed, but their own economic wealth have either been confiscated or deliberately destroyed. This is a scorched as tactics where you don't only beat and defeat your enemy, but you destroy whatever your enemy can fall back on. So I cited some key examples where these things happened, especially in the Dakta region, where about 370,000 animals have been destroyed and stolen from these people and how their grains or harvest have been snatched for the feeding of the insurgents and how in Zabarmari on the 1st of December not only did the insurgents come to the community and kill some people and destroy their own harvested crops but they also set ablaze the farms that are yet to be harvested one of the victims appealed to NTA on 2nd of December that 300 of the bags of rice he harvested through the help of laborers from a loan he borrowed from a bank were all destroyed and he is now left with the bill to settle the bank loan and pay the laborers. All these are tales of woo that are very common in a lot of these studies. And practically also, since the story about the attack, uh, attack on Natele, Arege, and Buni Yadi, even as we were preparing for this conference yesterday, there were similar attacks on Mule. And the day before, there was also in Budum Valley. And for the communities, especially around my degree on the southeast and southern flanks, it is almost becoming like their telephone ringtone to hear that bombs are still dropped, even as we speak, <coughs> just a few days to Christmas. So, in summary, these communities we want to review are highly unsettled. They can only be reviewed if effective control is exerted on such communities and if the insurgency has been brought to an end through what I consider as negotiated settlements. Because as you negotiate settlements, you are paying pay to the crisis because it is then that you can think about this your operation self corridor, de-radicalization and reintegration of the repentant Boko Haram. But unless this is done, to attempt reintegrating people who have just been criminalized because of uncomfortable situation is to put an old wine in a new bottle. These people that are being de-radicalized, especially in Bombay, at Mother City, and Bonje, Maguire, and other places, in my own opinion, are not fit yet to be reintegrated in society, even if it is just general society. But more dangerously, if you attempt to reintegrate them in their local communities, 
from the little interactions I've had with some of the victims, although some of the international agencies say we should call them victims because we are now verifying the insurgents, we should call them survivors. But I know what others may think, they are still victims. <coughs> if you dare take this, some of these so-called repentant Boko Haram back to their communities, you are amplifying the crisis because the people are really traumatized, even if you can rebuild some houses for them, for such a reintegration. So with this brief scenario, what do I have in mind as a suggestion that could be done? First, I am suggesting that extreme caution should be exercised on the part of government in celebrating so-called victory over Boko Haram. We shouldn't be singing songs of victory even in low terms. We should rather concentrate on removing what we call the remnant of the Boko Haram to make sure that these communities are safe, secure, and settled before we can continue with the other problems. Secondly, I argue that Operation Safe Haven Corridor will be more effective and enduring if the deradicalization program is executed only after the negotiated settlement. At this stage, the surrender forces and those who have been de-radicalized can still be rehabilitated as a stopgap measure. But this should be in such a way that you don't just throw repentant Boko Haram in the hands of governors who have no time. Because you know that any governor receiving repentant Boko Haram with a view to reintegrating them in the society which is so vague will definitely translate or transfer that responsibility to the local government chairman or to the traditional rulers who do not even have control domain. And before we know it, these people will be so frustrated that they will go back to the habit they know best. Recidivism will be very hard. So what is my thought on that? I have this clear thinking that since we are engaged in rehabilitating and de-radicalizing the quote-unquote repentant or penitent Boko Haram, why don't we create a time of economic engagement for this group and find a place for them to be superintended by some agencies that are competent to handle capacity building and some vocation on a prolonged basis. Not the type of three, four months training in Malam CD. And if these people are tested in civil society to the extent that the veracity of the deradicalization has shown, then we can now think of gradually sending them to the community they choose to be, including their own home communities. But unless that is done, I have high fear. Then the next idea I showed is, based on the superficial of this now, the humanitarian management is in chaos. My own suggestion, therefore, is to be more coordinated in our approach to the humanitarian management, and above all, this thing we have been singing all over, that there is no East Development Commission, which was muted in 2015, approved by the President in 2016, and yet the committee is yet to be inaugurated. I think it's high time we did inaugurate them so that they will start their own business. And what business do I have for them? Somebody has already discussed it. I, I like General Baras' contribution, and uh, Dr. Uke Chiku, and some others who say that we need a long-term, committed, consistent, strategic plan. 
And in the paper, I call it the true Marshall Plan. And this true Marshall Plan must be coordinated by one body, and all other assistants must be funneled through it. This may bring a territorial competition among the existing agencies for the human ground. Nonetheless, I think with painstaking design of responsibilities, each of them will find a place, but they have to submit to the central coordinating authority. And what I have in mind is the Marshall Plan. I will go back to Nyerere. You have devastated villages. These villages were uneconomical in their own location and concentration. By divine provision and provision, these communities have been scattered. Isn't it high time for us to reconstruct and re pattern our village and rural community settlement under the villagization scheme? Even if it is not a replica of the Ujamaa, at least it will be more coordinated type of resettling these village communities. And when we are doing that, we shall not be only concerned with resolving and preserving traditional network of leaders, but we should be concerned more with functional reality in which utilities, amenities, and infrastructure can be better distributed, employment can be more coordinated, and growth poor in terms of industrial development with industrial clusters in all the local governments can be better organized. This is what the final uh, idea I have. And I think if we could do that, it's not simply by pronouncing, but we really have to be engaged in detailed planning. And finally, I think if we can do so by involving the local community, although we will still step on some stores, there is no need getting 50 brothers on the house when they are all subjects and not getting anything. You can streamline them, give some responsibility for the laws that are losing territories, and still function. But I have a strong belief that if the community leaders, including the youth and key stakeholders, are engaged in our long term plan, which under it will have video and short plan. <coughs> we will get a better picture of rebuilding such community and more positive results will come out of it. Thank you very much. Please another round of applause for that exposition. I to say that if we already have your email address, you should have the, the paper he's, he's spoken to. Um, but if not, if we got your email today, we'll still send it to you. Um, please, uh, to invite other panelists to join us on stage, Mohamed Danjuma, uh, he's the Head of Program Management and Coordination, Presidential Committee for Northeast Intervention. Essentially, it's his challenge to fix or rebuild lives in the, the Northeast. A round of applause for Mohamed. And Ambassador Ahmed Magaji, he's a member of the Steering Committee, Guzar Institute. Ambassador Magaji. Okay, moving right into it, um, I think it would be good to start with Mohamed. Um, your, your chat with at PCNI, um, you know, rebuilding lives, uh, getting the IDPs back to their homes, uh, your chat with coming up with some great idea on how to redevelop you know, the Northeast, they will hire a plan. If you can, in you know, very quick, uh, maybe two minutes, summarize for us what the Buhari plan has uh, or says about how to redevelop uh, the Northeast side of the United Thank you very much, Kaji. And um, I want to first of all acknowledge the group of and um, other presenters that have spoken in the earlier session for the very robust and the insightful um, postulations. Like you said, the Buhari plan is the blueprint that the PCNI was um, in a place to operationalize. In 2015, at the inception of um, 
the present administration, it was obvious that we needed a new direction. So many players were on the field, both humanitarian and uh, development. So many government agencies were also involved at different levels. There was that need for coordination, which was what birthed the presidential committee on the Northeast Initiative. And the first of its mandate was to coordinate all these multifaceted responses in the, in the entire uh, Northeast. The first thing was, of course, what are the documents that were already existing? We know in 2013-14, at the end of 2014, the six states of the Northeast had uh, produced a document they called Northeast Transformation, Northeast States Transformation Strategy. Next, as um, a follow-up from the Northeast Economic um, um, Summit that they had in 2013, that formed the basic document that was available readily that quantified the needs as presented by the respective states. Who, which, who, each of the states had their own peculiarities in terms of needs. Bruno, Adamawa, and maybe of course, uh, the heavily affected, with Bruno having carried the largest share of the, the effect of the insolvency. But the other contiguous states of Taraba, Gombe, and Bochi also had their own share of um, and how they were affected as a result of the uh, displacement that they had to contend with that stretched um, social services and uh, of course very, very scarce resources. So that document formed the basis as well as others, the documents that have been put together. Um, you heard the vice chairman in his opening remark, he made mention of the peace building and um, um, peace, building, uh, peace building assessment that was done in 2015, late, which was more or less the only assessment we have, the coherent assessment that we have, that actually quantified the amount of um, damage and the need therein. So we took all this and what other agencies are doing, including NEMA and uh, the states themselves, uh, Refugee Commission and um, Victim Support Fund, which of course was also another committee. There was a committee on, victi uh, on the, the victim, victim support uh, that was inaugurated in 2014, there yeah, about, you know, that was chaired by General Tiwa Juma, which basically rallied the private sector to contribute money in a uh, bid to respond to the ensuing insurgents. Uh, so we brought all this together and um, within a quick, short period of time, we tried to put together a plan that would look at the immediate needs, intermediate needs, and of course, as, uh, the long-term aspirations. But if you look at the Bohari plan, which has four, four, four volumes, it dwells heavily in emergency assistance and um, stabilization at the first instance, which of course had to contain with humanitarian issues that were prevalent, especially in the three states of Bruno, Adama, and Yubi. And, and uh, of course, there's an intermediary aspect of the plan, which looks at early recovery and um, peace building. And finally, the third volume, of course, is the um, long-term economic needs of the region. And, of, and um, the fourth volume is, of course, institutional arrangement, which, interestingly, if you read, also provided for uh, an entity that would not only um, take over at the end of the intervention that the PCN would do, but that would be owned by the states themselves. Because for it to be sustainable, it has to be a bottom up approach that is owned by the the states themselves, and of course, that takes into account their peculiarities. So the Bohari plan put that all in, in place. It's, uh, it's about 800 pages, very ambitious, that looks at um, all the sort of these needs that are, are being addressed now. But beyond that, 2015, late to now, is how many years? 
a lot has shifted and um, a lot has also happened in terms of um, the response. So there is that need to take a pause and look at where we are. Where have we come to from where we started? Do we need to re-invalidate re what we have done and then strategize and update the plan? Yes, that's actually needed. And that is what is already in the process of being done now. So for now, for now, what what are you doing exactly now? Are you really, you know returning the IDPs back to their communities? Are you rebuilding those communities? What is uh, PCNI doing to ensure that when they get back to their communities, that they have the ability to restart their lives, um, have economic capacities, and so on and so forth? One thing that is of consensus in every forum that I have attended, and of course, is the fact that it is a whole of government and whole of the civil space approach that should be able to actually address this whole problem. Government alone cannot do it. The same way the civil society alone, our development partners and humanitarian partners, it requires everybody on board. So the PCNS coordination has been able to, first of all, Let's identify the needs. How do we stabilize and reach out to people that are already devastated and dislocated from their ancestral homes? And either the host communities across the Northeast or in camps. How do we also ensure that the, military, the ongoing effort by the military is being complemented by these soft approaches that will ensure that it's not about only rebuilding the structures, but rebuilding the livelihoods of people. Return has to be coordinated, it has to be voluntary. These are things that become organic once the providing situations are in place. Infrastructure needs to be in place. And of course, social services need to be re re um, restored in most of these communities that have been hitherto um, destroyed by the insurgents. So the first thing was for the PCI was to ensure that we coordinate everybody to, be, to stabilize the region and ensure that the resources that are going there are going meeting those needs that are prevalent. Before now, we've heard of malnutrition cases and, um, of course, hunger everywhere. But that, in the, in the first instance, it has been attended to. Now we are in the early recovery aspect and then beginning to rebuild the livelihoods and the social infrastructure. So the PCNI has been focusing on in doing that. And while we are doing concurrent planning, both with uh, the development partners and the humanitarian actors, there has to be a point. Now we have reached the point where we have said, look, let's stop. The humanitarian response, we have to ensure that we see it progressively decline over the next three years. Because a lot of dependency syndrome has set in. A lot of, um, um, I, so many um, um, effects of this continuous unintended, unintended uh, response. There are nations of crisis, all these things are there that are happening that we all know. And it's because of the protracted response to humanitarian res um, crisis. But we said, stop. Let's see a three-year or multi-year plan, not the annual humanitarian plans that we are doing. And we'll go back to the same cycle next year and the same um, the response that we're getting. Let's see it progressively decline while socioeconomic development progressively increase over the next three to five years. Excellent. So that's where we are. Okay, um, let me move to Ambassador Magaji. And I wonder if you've got a response to the PCNI plan um, and the way it's being implemented. In your view, have we not locked ourselves into this dependency cycle? Or is there a way out where these lives can be? really and truly rebuilt, where people can go back to their communities and restart their lives. Thank you very much, I was afraid you are not going to ask me that question. <laughs> uh, my take is, my take is whatever plan, whatever structures 
we are going to put to address the problem of resettling people and resettling communities must be based on uh, certain achievements, first of all. Because to do otherwise is just to waste our time, as I believe is happening in many instances currently. As you know, my, my background is to try to look at this initiative, not in terms of the efficiency of the world work, I'm not an expert there, nor am I an expert in economies, but to see whether from the viewpoint of intelligence and security issues, whether the conditions exist for them to work. And I'm afraid the answer currently is no. Now, if you look at the recent success of Boko Haram over the past few years, it illustrates to you that the argument we are trying to advance, that it is time for us to do certain things for the resettlement of communities, cannot be done. We can play around with words, we can call the situation that Boko Haram has been technically integrated. I don't know what that means. But what people want to hear is not technically degraded, it is totally destroyed. If we are not able to get into a situation where people have confidence in the security services, in government uh, agencies, to be able to deliver, then once that trust is lost, it is going to be very, very difficult for you to get those people to to cooperate and to return as you would like that. I'll give you a couple of examples. The first is that in the last attack that Prof spoke about, people were invited by the military and based on the trust they have on the military that it is safe to go back. Unfortunately, they found that not to be the case. Now, try inviting them next week. They are not going to respond. So I think the first thing we need to do is to make sure that the trust is built between the military and the people, between the security services and the people, and within the security services themselves. Because people think that it is not important, but the disagreement on policy, disagreement on tactics within the military and within the services and within government that come out into the public have an effect on eroding the confidence of people in the ability of military, security, government being able to deliver on their promises. And unless that trust is built and sustained, no initiative is going to work in my view. Now, there's another important issue that was raised, which is the role of the traditional institution, the traditional govern, governance structure in the areas. I have a friend who is an army, who has been in Abuja for the past uh, 10 years. He is a traditional ruler. And uh, as late as yesterday, I told him about this conference and asked him when last he was in Medjugorje, he was last in Medjugorje 10 years ago. So I'm suggesting maybe we make him the Galadima of Baba because <laughs> he's, he's, he's not administering anything. I don't think anyone has come up with a plan to integrate those people who are in exile as leaders. Why don't we put them together with the military, with the state government, and try to fashion out how do we return? Because for them, it is very easy. It uh, kind of illustrates the oppressive nature of the Nigerian state. You have got farmers who have been displaced, who have lost their crops, who have lost the ability to pay bank loan that they must pay. 
But you've got their traditional leaders who have fled to Maiduguri, Kaduna, and Abuja, and they're still collecting their salary. So they have no incentive to go back. So I'm sure we'll find somewhere in our constitution that guarantees them the right to fear. So if they fear, they should remain where they are. And they should really consider having people who are on the ground who are willing to build their communities appointed in their place. I'm sure that will give them some incentive to say, okay, this is the best way for us to go back. Let me stop here right now. Thank you very much. And I want to go to Prof. Uh, as someone who's you know very close to the grassroots, uh, your center does a lot of work in these communities. Are you beginning to see any ideas, any homegrown ideas on how these communities can be rebuilt? Um, because it appears that where we're stuck now is unless we uh, achieve real security stability, you know, real uh, redevelopment can happen. But I'm wondering. The local communities, are there some sprouts, some green shoots, you know, of ideas that you're beginning to see on how they think that with some support they can rebuild their lives, uh, even within all the conflict that's still going on? Thank you very much. I think a straight answer to that question is no. There is no definitive uh, strand of strategy that we have gleaned from our interaction and researches that seems to prefer a workable solution in these communities. But from the message we get in either discussing with them during training, especially on reconciliation, reintegration, there is a kind of confusion going on. In fact, the traditional rulers that we used to know them, highly revered by their communities, some of them had been indicted in the Boko Haram crisis. Some were alleged that they colluded and collaborated with the insurgents, which may be true in practical sense, but they, had, they were justified by so doing because they were the first target of attack whenever insurgents visited a community. And in fact, the insurgents were so clever that they, that they started with convincing or polluting the minds of the children of the traditional rulers. And most of the time, unknown to the traditional ruler, his son may be hiding weapons for Boko Haram. And in the course of military raids, there were some couple or very few of them though, of these traditional or community leaders, they were caught with dangerous weapons. And after investigation, little did they know that such dangerous weapons got their way into their homes through their own children. So out of fear, some of these community leaders were silenced. And their immediate neighbors knew what was happening, but they were also intimidated. So there's a high fall level of suspicion. A typical example is a community called Menok, which is between Maiduguri and Belisheh. They have been notoriously indicted and accused and the traditional leadership there was also indicted to have been collaborating. So because of this, the figures we get from the center in our researches of the interaction is that these, some of the traditional leaders also are sus suspects. But for the ordinary people, what you get from them as suggestion, especially in my interaction with the Gaza community, who are trained on how to forgive and receive repentant bomb of Karam in their community, presumably also feeling comfortable because the government has reconstructed their houses. They told us that all this radio and TV story you hear about reconstructed and reduced structures 
especially in Goza, were houses of very influential people. Some of the households never got their house burned, were because of their influence table. They were given priority to get those houses reconstructed, especially those that went through the Ministry for Triple R in Buenos Aires. State. So their interpretation is that there is a patent intention to discriminate based on political inclination or personal favoritism against the really desperate persons in need. So I think the suggestion they are saying wishing or soliciting for is fairness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mohamed, the, there's a lot of uh, argument around the DDR that's being proposed um, for the penitents uh, Boko Haram insurgents. And I wonder if there's been any engagement with the communities to see if the communities are willing to reabsorb uh, these uh, repentant uh, insurgents if they're just going to be dumped on the community and what effect that would have in the efforts to rebuild cohesion you know, within, within these communities. I think um, um, for us, our position has always been very clear. If this is more or less like a case of putting the cart before the horse. Because like an earlier speaker had said, um, very clearly spelled out. It's only going to spark another crisis. If at this point we want to try to uh, integrate the repentant, so called repentant insurgents into the community, when even the communities themselves have not been rehabilitated or the, 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 the victims themselves have not been um, completely rehabilitated, they are hiding from our lives. So it's, it's a policy that um, we are right now really speaking with the Russian civil democracy how that um, strategy can be reorganized completely. Because as it is right now, the insurgency is still not going. They are still displacing and happening as we are speaking. You know? So how do you begin to say you want to need to which communities? That's the question. Now, in earlier, uh, Professor Mara made uh, a, a very, very clear um, aside from some of these historical causes of the insurgency itself, which, as far as we can see right now, we are only responding to the symptoms. We have not started addressing the root causes of the insurgency itself, or what provided the enabling environment for the insurgency to even thrive in the first instance. There are some local governments in Bono that were never attacked. They are more resilient to be how, like you mentioned. Why? Why are they resilient? Have we interrogated the fabrics of those communities and what made them more resilient? If you look at the indicators, it's because of the simple fact that some of the things that we are taking for granted, poverty, education, social cohesion itself, that makes up a community are very, very strong in some of those places. That's why they are resilient. Why is it not happening in the Northwest or anywhere else? There's also poverty in those places. Why? Because they have more um, resilient communities that have provided, that have, that have some kind of um, social governance within them that is, that is still residual, that will allow or disallow anything foreign to come into. So the communities we have, especially as, as regards to the large expanse of space and the so-called quote-unquote ungoverned spaces, All spaces yeah. has provided the enabling environment for this insurgency to thrive. So in rebuilding back, how do we rebuild rebuild back better? Did we take into cognizance some of these inherent uh, constitutions that provided the you know so those are the things that we must really look at. Of 
course, we have that um, the, the child is 10% of what it used to be 30 years ago, which provided the bastion of economic activities in the whole of that the child is in. So the, the, the resources are doing to have a population. It's growing. We have young people there that have not come in contact with any form of um, um, proper livelihood or, or um, education for them to be able to make meaningful or careful um, use of their lives. They the same that if you do not provide for your young people something to live for, someone will provide for them something to die for. Yeah. And that's what's happening. Excellent. Excellent. So, so we, we are saying these things must be organic. These communities and building them back is not to build them back to what they were for. We will have a secondary displacement or a resurgence of this resurgence in another 10 15 years. We are talking about a community that has over 15,000 offers that I have not seen the four walls of a classroom in the last how many years? What happens to them in the next 10 years? Not to talk of those that, were, that witnessed the slaughter of their own heads or the thousands of views. That, have, that, have, that was created by the same insurgency. So we have to look beyond just the building structures. Like he said, we have to rebuild lives. Yeah. That's what Professor used to say. Yes. First of all, we, we have to start thinking about the people that make up the Northeast. What, how do we build these communities back better so that we don't have insurgency? And first, there are issues of access. That is why we said the, even the military strategy has to be concurrently backed with a deliberately coordinated um, social economic strategy that is happening simultaneously. Where there are access issues, you start from the places that are accessible and build the, 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 the public utilities that will begin to catalyze social um, activities. For the, for the soldier, there is access as far as it's concerned, the defeated, the the insurgents. But for the development person, the social economic fiber of that community needs to be rebuilt. We need to have the schools. We need to have the police, but cops, roads, markets. Let, let me go to Ambassador Magadji and then I'll open it up for, for the audience to, to contribute. Um, if you look at the, the north, or even just the northeast, there are huge, large expanses of land that look quite impossible to govern. I was reading some submission that tended to suggest that maybe in this effort to rebuild the Northeast, we try some kind of a social engineering where you cluster these communities so that you can go in provide the amenities, provide security, provide schools within manageable clusters. I immediately felt that there could be unintended consequences to that, but I wonder what you feel. Uh, is that a good suggestion, given that we have these large expanses of land that we possibly might not be able to govern in the nearest future? But for me, I don't think this is a valid argument. First, we are not the largest country in Africa, for example. There are countries that are much bigger than us that don't have any of these problems. Try Sudan. Small population, large expanse of land. No, even I'm talking of Sudan, not South Sudan. Large expanses of land. And when they have problems, at least to some extent, they were able to bring it under control. I'm not talking of the North Sudan, South Sudan. I'm talking of the Darfur issue. Look at our neighbors. They have larger expanse of so-called ungovernable, ungoverned spaces than we do. Chat. Look at Niger. What is the ratio of uh, people to the landmark? But they are doing very well, uh, protecting their territory. Algeria. So. I don't think it is valid. If we are serious and we want to secure our territory, we can do it. Uh, you don't secure territories 
by men alone, you can secure territories by other means. And then the by technology, but many countries are doing it. Now, I think what is important is for us to look at what brought us to where we are. We were extremely negative, and we still are, regarding the use of intelligence to stop problems coming. There were danger signs, there were alerts, there were information more than 15 years ago that this is what is likely to happen. There is a book that was written by uh, an Islamic guy, where I will come back and speak for one minute about it, about Boko Haram coming to exist. Something like Boko Haram. We wrote it this from the North Sheikh Sheikh Saleh al He wrote something about that. Nobody took it seriously. There were cases of training of Nigerians in other places where similar things took place. We knew our boys were going to Kenya, uh, crossing over into the Gulf of Aden, and finding their ways into Yemen and other places, getting training and coming back. Boys were training with Shabbat. They were training with Shabbat. They were training with insurgents in Algeria. Nobody is sitting down to interrogate those who are responsible. That what happened to all this information? And we were overwhelmed. And this is exactly what is happening now. Even though on a smaller scale, how come there is no intelligence that a town that was declared safe? two months ago, was attacked. Somebody must be held accountable. Somebody must be responsible. So we talk about that we have life space. Many people have larger spaces than we do. Try this in Australia or New Zealand. So it's not about space. It's about our attitude to our security, our lack of use of intelligence, and generally our carelessness in terms of uh, addressing danger before it comes. Sorry. Just a second. I mentioned Sheikh uh, Sharif Sh 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 and Prof made a lot of good points regarding dislocation of society. And one of the things that has happened is somebody like that, Claire who was effectively running a postgraduate system in clerical terms. It's running like several post, a postgraduate school, teaching uh, Islamic scholars in a responsible way. Had that whole system collapsed. And he is the, one of the leading intellectuals for what is likely to impact on uh, Islamic education is that responsible teachers like that have been displaced and the scholarship space, a scholarship space has been created where they have, they have been displaced and you are now likely to get more and more irresponsible kind of scholarship taking place. I think we should look into that problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's open it up for comments. Uh, we'll start from here. My name is Dr. Dayakusa. I'm a conflict transformation expert based in Abuja. My starter is an observation. We cannot be discussing missed opportunities in the Northeast with no woman from the Northeast on the panel. I believe that for next time, next year should take note of this. Get a woman from the Northeast to speak about the problems of women in that zone. It's very important. Humanity cannot continue to live on just one leg. Two legs make a person work. That is said. Number two, earlier this year, I was a facilitator at the Governor's Forum of the Lake Chad Basin Governor's Forum, held in my degree. It was a robust forum with a lot of funding in the basket from the European Union, 
the UN, and so forth. And after the Oslo summit, they said that the governors of the region should do something tangible, and they are it. Therefore, there should be synergy. When talking about these issues, we should look at what the governors forum is doing in the Victor region, and not just talk in isolation, in silos. We need to refer to what has been done. Number three, rebuilding lives in the Northeast is not beans. It's difficult because it's a long-standing issue, and therefore, we're talking about community resilience. There's a work by CTAD. I think they were there sometime. Yeah, is it around? I don't know. But they did a work on community resilience. Why some communities are more resilient than others? I think we need to look into that. Rebuilding communities is a difficult task. The task of DDRR is almost impossible. So we cannot be talking about returning these people now in spite of the safe corridors. I don't know how safe they are because there's even resistance from the communities to these people. They say they're taking more care of the insurgents that are repentant in quotes than they who really need it. That debate is for another day. Then number three, I think from this forum, a synergy amongst practitioners, academics, and um, policy makers needs to start here. I've not heard about it for the next East. I think next year is a good forum to ensure that happens. Because you're always gathering practitioners, academics, and uh, policy makers. Let's do something. And it will be an initiative of next year and the Yara Center that we move it forward. And that is it, lastly. There has been so much emphasis on the military approach. It won't work. The strategy initially of the anti-insurgency uh, strategy included not only military, but a soft approach. Buying back the minds of the people, CDD, Center for Democracy and Development, and other important uh, NGOs have been doing a lot of work on the re creating the narrative in the Northeast through the clergies. Lastly, last, last, last. <laughs> the narrative that the woman is meek, she likes peace and all that, is changing fast. Not all women, especially in the Northeast, love that kind of peace of the graveyard. They have been radicalized by seeing their husbands and sons being killed in their presence. Their daughters being raped and they are now at the forefront, carrying food that they know has IED to places where they can cause havoc. Carrying guns for the men in their handbags and they are not noticed. The narrative is changing. So when you see a woman, you don't just think she loves peace because she has been radicalized. So those are the issues we should be looking at in the Northeast. The narrative has changed and we need to change with the narrative. And next year is a good platform for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is uh, Mario GK, the Minister of Justice. For now, before some minutes now, the military approach has been discussed here. I want to know what is the ability of our military to hold spaces that are being recovered. You see what happened recently? Places that were recovered, in fact, as I said, the 19 of those soldiers were buried in, in Madrid. What is the military really doing? What is the tell as somebody on the panel said? Do we have the capacity, the technology, the software to man all these borders? That's those borders. Somebody said on government space is not a valid argument. I say it is. When you cannot govern a place effectively, no government presence, people do what they want to do. That would be a breeding ground for these terrorists to continue to do what they want to do. What about the intel? What about the technology to govern all these things? We have it in other places, we are still using the traditional decade approach to you know, govern our borders so porous, so porous, Excellent. so porous. How do we do that? Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. I want to add to uh, what uh, Ambassador said about resp having responsible scholars.
I think this is something we should be uh, very much concerned about because if we allow um, uh, an open space for irresponsible scholars to get into, if we, you agree with me, the, the idea of Boko Haram started with such irresponsible scholars. So if we did not curtail, um, if we allow them to take this advantage that, uh, and continue to suppress that kind of um, um, idea of Boko Haram, uh, I think the problem will continue even in the future. So we need to create a way for responsible scholars to be able to um, have, especially the young people, guided on the, the, the right and responsible, or the real message of the religion they are practicing. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman in front. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Samad Tamim, President of Nigerian Economic Students Association, Ahmad Bell University. Um, uh, my question goes directly to the uh, head of uh, you know, uh, PCNI. Um, according to a report by uh, the UNICEF in 2016, April, uh, there are about 14 million, uh, 14.8 million uh, people affected by the uh, crisis in the northeastern states. And also in another report that uh, there are about 60,000 orphans, uh, children that have become orphans as a result of the uh, incidents in uh, Medikuri. So now my question is, most of these uh, orphans witnessed when their parents were being slaughtered. And the only thing that is, is, is now in their minds is vengeance. So now what is PCNI doing which is aligned with the uh, sustainable development goals of the UNDP uh, to, uh, you know, curtail the uh, uh, upcoming, you know, uh, uh, issue. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Very much. Okay. From the Department of Political Science, University of Manitoukoury. I am happy to be here. Unfortunately, I missed the first um, session. I want to quickly um, say a few things here. Um, one first and foremost about our military strategy. There is a, a military complacence and weakness against Boko Haram in the past. There is no doubt about that. I am privy to um, interaction with some of these military officers in operation. I can imagine somebody going to a war zone, having a, 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 trying to install a digital uh, set there, having a bigger generator while you are in war zone watching football. It is very, very obvious they are doing that. If you go, why, um, what happened in Italy and uh, other uh, military uh, camps, where as a result of the complacency, the military were so relaxed. The, the, the stimulus response strategy was not working in 2013, 2014. And that was why they now adopted uh, uh, this strategy of pay down, defend, and take over, which is also not working. That was a, 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 an archaic policy. And now they have resolved into what they call uh, repel them and then defend, which is quite very, very wrong. Uh, communities have reported that uh, I've seen as um, uh, Boko Haram moving left, right, center last week. Uh, farmers were killed in a very close uh, range. You cannot leave Medukuri uh, and go outside within one kilometer and get safe. You are not safe. One kilometer radius, you are not safe. And the military, um, the communities have reported these things to the military and they said, no, they have not been given order to go ahead. And uh, that's why I said there is very there's a very serious challenge with the military strategy. Sure. And, um, and uh, quickly, I also want to say that um, in terms of uh, the displacement, we have serious problem of data generation and data collection. Um, no Nigerian agency, and, and I say it with all authority, no Nigerian agency can tell you that these are the numbers of persons displaced. These are the numbers of persons rehabilitated. I have done uh, some work with the IOM and then IDMRC. Uh, they are the authentic um, data processing uh, 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 arms within the displaced zones in Nigeria. 
uh, they have been working with, um, they have been doing work on displacement and um, tracking matrix. Okay. They have been working on that. And I quickly want to say that I want to give them um, some quick solution here. Nigerians should understand that we are at war. There's no doubt about that. I've interacted with uh, officers from the war front, and I've discovered that we have not actually mm. given a focus that Nigeria is at war. That's why we're so relaxed, and we feel that Nigeria is not at war. Some military personnel have told me that if they're given the responsibility to do what is needful, within one day, Boko Haram would, have, would be a history. Mm -hmm. why, why are we not having Boko Haram in Chad? Why are we not having Boko Haram in Niger? Why are we not having Boko Haram in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Cameroon? Why are they concentrated in Nigeria? All the attacks happening in Cameroon, in Chad, and Niger, they all emanate from Nigeria. And these are my quick solution. Number one, while we're talking about this, um, um, this uh, returning uh, the displaced person. I said, if Nigeria can move uh, communities between 15 to 20 kilometer radius and declare it as a war zone, anything that they see there should, should be a target. That will solve the problem. Now, these people have been using the communities as human shield, and that has been a problem. I also want to talk about inclusive, go uh, inclusive security. Uh, the uh, communities are very, very vital in terms of providing security. Uh, a few days before I left Meiduguri, I interacted with uh, some officers who are manning the borders around uh, uh, Gubio, Axis, and others. They said, look, the, the, they are officers. They said, look, we are not, we are not capable. It's the community that can police themselves. Sure. That they rely mostly on the civilian JTF rather than the soldiers and the police. Excellent. I think that's Excellent. very, very thank, important thank you. Thank you. when we talk about this um, rehabilitation and displacement. I want thank, to open. thank you, thank you. Let's take, let's take others, please. My name is Dr. Salis Mohammed. I was just recently completed a project for USAID in the Northeast for promoting livelihood and reintegrating internally displaced persons. Now, my concern <coughs> is, during that project, that spanned Andama, Yobi, and uh, Bono states, we were able to cover almost 270 communities. So my concern is, having left that place, this is about four, five months now, did PCNI has, as a deliberate policy, to follow up on projects like my own, that has just closed, and look for, for example, the 25,000 vulnerable households that we are able to move them using agriculture as the basis for recovery and giving them skills and capacity to be able to deploy once they are clear and uh, they are clear and return to their community. Has PC, does PCNI has any internal mechanism for financing such? Uh, of the livelihood uh, uh, programs and initiatives. Excellent. Are Excellent. So, uh, finally, sorry, just one moment. Finally, let me let me mention that I had the uh, Dr. Delpha mention. No, they are professors. Uh, yeah. I, if you say uh, how our community in Southern Borno was not attacked by Boko Haram, I may differ with that a little because from Boratai up to uh, Bombi in Adamawa State, there is no single community that I did not deploy my staff to work there with the people there. I think a lot of destruction happened even in our local government. But you, as a community, was not attacked, but the insurgents came as far as the military base in view. And it was a battle for about two, three days. And because of the resilience and the resistance of the people of you, they were able to repair them and they never came back again. Then finally to the issue of Minoc. Somebody mentioned Minoc. Minoc is a flashpoint. Minoc is one of the communities where my team worked for one and a half years as well. Now in Minoc, what happened was that in Minoc, Minoc is a town that is divided into two by the, by the main road. One part is inhabited by what you can call normal people. The other one is inhabited by the Boko Haram. 
So at a point in time, this is this like four, five, six years ago, there was like a silent pact between between the members of the community. We will not report you and you will not attack us. <laughs> but when military when when after the declaration of uh, when when the North East uh, was uh, a declaration of emergency, the whole dynamics changed. So Minoc as we speak today is the flashpoint. You go in there, you find Boko Haram. In fact, if we are moving from Meduguri to to to, to Damatu, some of the flashpoints are Minoc uh, in Gandu uh, and Binshek. Because the security will need to clear the road for you to go. Because there is consistent up to this moment a passage where you see them in mass coming to pass. Sometimes they, they don't disturb anybody and then they pass. So my concern for the military is if they know this and this has become something that is like daylight to everybody, why, why, what are we doing about it? Sure, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, once again. I'm the CEO of the Economics and Human Support Foundation. I'm not going to talk as a politician, I'm going to talk as an NGO. Uh, we have written a proposal to uh, PCNI at the point in time on how to use cooperative societies as vehicle for development. And I believe all over the world it has, it has been proved that cooperative societies are really vehicles for development. It has been proven in Pakistan, Indonesia, India, and so many other countries. I don't know why we cannot use that model in Nigeria. All these IDPs um, can be grouped based on where they come from, based on their immediate communities, based on their professions, sure. and they can be grouped into cooperative societies and be trained, be given skills in various businesses that have value chains, be divided along the value chain and be supported and create access to finance for them through Bank of Agri, Bank of Industry, um, NGOs, international NGOs, and, uh, and civil international organizations. This should be integrated into the PCNI strategy for resettlement and uh, reintegration into society. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Keke, for my life. A few observations. Number one, the general view that uh, Boko Haram is, a, what do you call it, um, degraded, disenfranchised, whatever. Let's look, and particularly PCNI, that that expression is not only really dece deceptive but misleading. Boko Haram exists to inflict havoc on the society. Since the time that thing was said, Boko Haram has been more effective than it's ever been. True or false? So let's stop this ourselves. Please, that expression should be dismissed completely. It's unhelpful to public consciousness and to the cycle of the armed forces. It's also misleading. Then the matter of resettling the people. This sense of community has disappeared. In the last 10 years, these people have bred predominantly people with a predatory disposition towards the environment. You need to survive. The concept of father, respect, those basic concepts that define our human relations have evaporated. So that we don't begin to assume that it's about infrastructure. It isn't. It's my respect for this gentleman here that I'm not thinking of beating him up and taking his dress. I have a black belt in karate. So it's, it, that's the truth of the matter. That has evaporated. So the rehabilitation of that place is not quite what it seems like. Then the matter of dams, yes, we are trying to bring water from the moon, but actually the entire Sahara is water, and we can do that. And the issue of dams, well, that's probably for another conversation. But the last two points I want to make is that the PCI should, PCNI should ask itself, that like, issue the gentleman right there, do you have the capacity to do the job given to you? Do you have the personnel and the spread? Is the focus right? Are the programs ideal? Is it possible that there's a focus on procurement and delivery rather than sustainable engagement? Those are the matters for the PCNI to address. And finally, on the matter of uh, making things work, every environment has power centers. There are people whom, you, if you talk to, there are two other people who listen to them. In the earlier session, somebody pointed out that some of the traditional, no, not actually, that uh, some of the traditional, those centers of authority are now in Abuja without authority. Is it possible to do for youth leaders? Is it possible, for instance, to determine individuals that have some measure of influence even in the camps and begin to reorient them and manage them in such a way that they become useful? The crux of the point I'm making is that the human basis for community, the concept of community is about communion, interpersonal relations. Feelings no longer matter there, only survival. 
But I think the bulk of the focus is on infrastructure, and that's very dangerous. So thank you. Thanks. See the triple can. The first that can add the source matrix levels. Well, I have a, a little bit, um, I differ a little bit on some of these uh, approaches. <coughs> Number one is that um, there is a general problem, I would say a major problem in Nigeria, that data or how to gather data is not feasible for now. For instance, in, the, in that, uh, that site, if there is a way of accrediting those that you think they are safe, or those that are in the ID camp, so that the army should know that these people are almost with them. It will help to, that is what I say by having like an identity card or a DNA that will help to know those who are with them and those who are not with them. So that whoever you see that is not with such ID card, becomes a suspect. That's number one. Number two is that there is no way they can be rehabilitated except they are sure that they are going to a safe level. So there is need to do a little bit of aggregation. This is emergency issue. We do a little bit of aggregation, uh, accumulating people and putting them on the side while on the other web you have a free zone, declare the war zone. And move on until you clear that part. And again, the people, the, 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 there is this arrangement that you get to with uh, Cameroon and so on, and Chad and the Chad, that they are repairing this book of Allah. So they should intensify efforts, the army, with, in conjunction with JTF, as it, as it may be, of trying to put them in, uh, to a corner. But the issue that they are being allowed, I think they are being treated something like we keep close, that we are allowed to mingle with the people. So it becomes very difficult because you don't know the human being you are dealing with. At times you will be dealing with the enemy thinking that you are dealing with the right person. Thank you. House of Thank you. My name is Honorable Khalil Mohamed Bello, National President of Kulek Allah Katuriara Association of Nigeria, Qatar. I might be seen as somebody who is uh, agitated to speak. Yes, I do so for the fact that I am here as, I consider myself as a voice who is voiceless. I am representing pastoralists who are the most endangered species in the Northeast and who are dying patiently with the hope of injecting life in the year after. Uh, surely, even this presidential committee, we consider it as exclusive, not inclusive. Because the pastoralists who, who, who have suffered, who, who are the most devastated, were not included there. In the, in the old plan, in their plan, the pastoralists are not even reflected there. Uh, for the fact that uh, they have forgotten that only God may know how many pastoralists were buried in the North East soil? How many pastoralists were completely or partially ruined? There are people there who lost several thousands of cattle. But in all these omissions made of billions of naira, like possibly, there is nothing, there is nothing to consider the pastoralists. For somebody who has a diploma in Nigeria, because I believe and I continue to believe that Nigeria is located in an unjust place. That is why we are not expecting the pastoralists, the Dalturian, to be treated equally with the other Nigerians. That is why we are used, abused, and completely doubt. This is very unfortunate and highly suitable. Uh, though I consider today as my coincidental day. Because the professor, the first letter was presented by my classmate, who was our class ref, and my undergraduate, one my undergraduate professor, right? And the second was presented by my lecturer during the undergraduate as postgraduate professor, Henry uh, Delopa. Though I consider this, that was why I have even forgotten to thank the Aradio Foundation and the Nexia SPDP for us. The people organizing or for providing this podium for us, of which we are exploiting 
our fundamental human rights to the fullest. I have forgotten to tell them why. Okay. I get you for providing peace and unity in our country, Nigeria. Thank you. So please, I am appealing to this committee. Please, to kind, we are also Nigerians. We are not, we are not concerned with dualization or solar energy. But in the portable drinking water, we don't have it in the North East. Our country were dying. No any provision was made for pasteurized. Are we not Nigerians? Lastly, somebody, someone retired colonel, uh, described to my own, that is his own perception, and I do respect his own view, everybody has his own view. He describes civilian JTF as explosive or time bomb. They might be, and they might not be. To our own civilian JTF, are people who were fired with nationalistic zeal and aspiration to save their fatherland. <laughs> because they were defeated, not because of civilian JTF. You will not get 10% of the Nigerian people. It was civilian JTF who sacrificed their life, chasing one who was holding the age of the seven, cutting and handing him over to the military. That is why we wonder why the Bognostic government refused to allow the to refuse to allow the hunters to join the military to fight those insiders. Because to me, it's not only insiders. Insidency and, and, uh, and this insidency and conventional battle. Because you call it insidency if you have killed the bush. Everywhere these people are around. You did not, we are supposed to defend. Nigeria is supposed to push these people away from Nigerian territory. I am not a military man. I am a hard political scientist or historian. So we are supposed to push them out from the country and then have a defensive line. And then internally we say we have insidency or whatever. We like. But a situation whereby everywhere they are rumoring about even five kilometers from my we are saying insidency. And we know many places where these people are available. We didn't go there, we are going to be on inside. Why can't we tell ourselves reality? Why are we deceiving? How long have we continued to deceive ourselves? Please kindly let us be realistic. Let us tell the truth, please. My question goes directly to Mohammed Dajima, the head of program. Um, you know, from when you were speaking initially, I just wondered whether you had a strategic plan. Yeah. You know, but then, you know, when you kept on speaking, you now said that you had. Then my question would be, do you have a comprehensive plan that would deal with the root cause? Because it looks as if this whole thing just like fire and arrow. That's awesome. You know, you have to have That's a strategic plan That's with awesome. an M and E inclusive. So that be able to monitor and then be able to uh, uh, kind of uh, assess, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever you have made, whatever you have made, achieve at the particular point, you have to really have the data and then you have to have an M and E That's what I'm saying. And all of us know whatever it is. And then, you know, generally it looks as if there is a there is no commitment and there is no patriotism. In this whole fight of, of Boko Haram, it looks as if everybody there's no seriousness, and I, I want to appeal to the to the ministry, I mean the military, and then the government in power. Let us be a little bit patriotic. Let us be patriotic to this country, Nigeria, because we don't have any other country than Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I also want to see the ambassadors alive to speak and speak more and speak more things because um, very interesting questions and. Uh, very valuable also that informs the reality on ground. Let me start by talking about what Dr. Jonathan said. I just speak one word from what he said, which is the issue of data. We cannot know where we are. We cannot even measure the progress we are making if we do not have the incredible and um, clean data with which to measure. We all agree that at the inception, we were all responding to humanitarian crisis, and the first thing on everybody's mind was how do we save lives? How do we stabilize the situation? How do we get people out of harm's way by providing them with shelter, by providing them with 
the required food assistance, non-food items that will allow them to stabilize, and of course, um, uh, ready to use and repeat food for the children that are minorities and all that. In that kind of situation, it's not about knowing the specific names of who we are responding to, but the number of lives that we are saving. And that formed the better part of the last three years of um, the response, which is, of course, emergency assistance and social stabilization. Now we are into early recovery, which is more or less a mixture of a little bit of humanitarian and um, um, some economic development responses, which will require for us to know who we are responding to. Who is the person receiving benefits? From who is he receiving? And how do we consistently measure how that person is moving from his state of vulnerability towards self-centeredness over time? Which speaks to the end of the she speaks to she, she, the last speaker asked about. So of course, one, one thing we have just um, gotten the Bakura to do is the non biometric data capture of all IPPs in conjunction with the statutory body or agency that is charged with the responsibility to do that, that is NIPSI, National, National Identity Management Commission, alongside other um, stakeholders, state governments themselves, the SEMAS, the NEMA, and um, to begin a quick evaluation of all the people that are. Of course, we've been talking about 2.4 million IDPs, 1.8 million IDPs. But we have come to a stage that we need to know who are the people we are responding to. Billions of naira and billions of um, uh, millions of dollars are being poured into that region and are going to that region now. That we cannot treat with the same way we treated the humanitarian response, which was why I said we needed to pause and get the commitment from everybody to buy into that process. So we have said we have five thematic areas that we must all collectively agree. What are we, all of us, doing? That is both government and non-government actors that are uh, responding to this. Livelihood. What are we doing in terms of livelihood? Which also includes what my brother from the Catholic leaders, pastoralists, has said. Everybody must be carried along. Um, peace building and social cohesion, and of course, government, local governance. What are we doing in those areas across the, 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 the rainbow of responders? Um, of course, um, durable solution. What are we doing in terms of durable solution? Who is doing business with people like uh, social services? You know, what are we doing in terms of um, basic services restoration? And of course, the issue of, um, um, of course, like I mentioned, the peace building and social cohesion and local <coughs> governance. What are the areas, what are our collective outcomes, all of us in this area? How do we measure ourselves in the next three, five years? What have we done? We must have ourselves accountable to a particular framework of plan to say, okay, we'll come every quarter to look at what we have done. If you have said you have gotten money either for the humanitarian response plan that before now used to be annual, but for the first time in 2019, we are having a multi-year plan that, that, is, um, that is for three years. Well, we can actually measure and see. USAID that you are doing this work, have, how have you, the money you say you have spent, on who? And we must have that collective pool from where everybody sits and um, source their beneficiaries. So the first thing we have done in PCI right now is to come up with this mechanism for coordination of all these multilateral banks and development partners responses to the Northeast, which is called the Northeast Recovery and Stability Program. For the first time, and it's not been done anywhere else in Africa or anywhere in the world, where you have the multilateral banks, both the African Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, the World Bank, and even themselves, agree to have a common management, program management platform, where all their funds are tied to investment plans that are developed by the states, the state action plans, based on their needs. And we have what we call the prioritization task force embedded within that chapter. That framework. So that these priorities are, um, are annually revised, revised so that we see who is doing what, so that there is no duplication and then there is complementarity. 
Somebody is responding in education, you are building classroom, and somebody is also providing infrastructure, and then somebody else is telling teachers. So we told them, well done. We know you have additional financing for the existing projects, SEPI, which responds in education, ENSHI, that responds in health, Pharmacy in agriculture and livelihood, um, YESO, Youth Empowerment Support Corporation, right? Which, and then, of course, the, the, the last one is the CSDP, the Community Development Program. 575 million dollars additional financing for those projects that are already ongoing. There is also a new one, the multi-sectoral crisis recovery project. 200 million dollars that the federal government takes, that is taking a loan, a long time loan, to respond specifically for the Northeast, which is responding is multi-sectoral because it is in health, education, um, wash, that's water and sanitation, and of course livelihood and peace building and social cohesion. So, how do we ensure that this money is, we get value for money? Because it is loan that we are taking. And then how do we ensure that there is complementarity across? So they signed up to it. We went down to African Development Bank, you should sign up to it. They have a 258 million dollar package, which was launched last week by the Vice President, on specifically on the 6th of this month. For the no other for the six states of five states of the Northeast, with the exception of only your state. It's also not sectoral. So for the first time, we have a one project management with PCUs that has provided shared services with the needs of the states for the next five years. So it appears to me that you've answered a few questions. One, that there's a plan, a strategic plan. Two, there's access to funding. Yes. The third question I'd, I'd like you to answer in 30 seconds or less is, do you have the capacity, which is the question okay if you ask, do you have the internal capacity to implement all of these things that you've built out? I think the mindset should the question should be a little bit. Not, PCNI is not an implementing agency. We are a coordinating agency. The major issue of implementation rests with the states. And the capacity, there's a depth of capacity there. So we made it a point of fact that all of these projects must have built into them huge component of capacity building because we do not want the whole um, space in the north is to be littered with consultants that will come and live without any residual um, um, capacity left within the states. So the states have to, the capacities have to be built. So there is a robust capacity building plan for that. The other question that you could answer quickly is the one um, on cooperative society. Thank you. And for that, yeah, exactly what um, uh, uh, my brother Iyam has have uh, postulated is what is already been implemented. PCN has done gone into agreement with Bank of Industry, the CBN, to begin to do those. And we have just concluded registering all the CSOs and CBOs across the whole entire state with which sectors that they have, with the, with the, with the view of ensuring that they build these cooperatives where they can access. But before you do that, there has to be inclusiveness. How do you get them to become financially inclusive? Get them to open bank accounts? get them to have some form of identity, because that's the only way you can measure. That's the only way you can help people. If not, you throw money and it goes down the drain. We know that our history of, of these loans and how they have been. People give for the can pay for bikes and they are gone. But we cannot treat economic recovery the way we treat humanitarian response, which is the point I'm trying to make. So first things first, we need to do as quickly as possible a remuneration of people that are in, in need, in some of the areas that are accessible, get them um, um, integrated and also give them some form of cut that gives them financial inclusion from the areas that are accessible because we can't do all at the same time. And as long, we also speak to the issue of capacity. So the PCNI is just two and a half years old. So we have to be learning and doing at the same time. But it's more or less like changing tires on a moving car. We cannot wait and say until we build the capacity before we respond. So we're responding and learning at the same time. But beyond the PCNI, which has a sunset date, PCNI's mandate ends at the end of next year. We also envisage a situation where the Northeast Development Commission, when it comes on to board, which is also another intervention that must have a sunset clause, because if not, we will continue to have these perpetual commissions. 
So what we are saying is we must build the capacity of the states to hold these resources and make them sustainable within their own regularities in such a way that resources that are being brought to stabilize the region, the region are used judiciously to the to what they are meant for. Thank you, thank you. And if you hand the microphone to Professor, he'll make his closing remarks and we can begin to wrap up. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think I have too much to say, but uh, I wanted to respond to the person who attributed that I said Hawaii was not attacked. It wasn't me that said it. Um, I'm from Hawaii local government also. I know it was attacked. And uh, also, if you let me say it was not attacked, it was attacked somewhere. And Burete is in the local government, so by extension, he is affected. I would like to acknowledge the presence of my sister, Kusa, who as far back as 1996 was been active in UNDB. I, I, I didn't know she was around until she spoke. Uh, but uh, substantively, the issue I would like just to respond to is the question you asked on the ungovernable space and the restructuring of communities. Uh, Ambassador answered the notion of ungovernable space and because of the diversity he cited examples that it might not be essentially necessary for us to reorganize the community, communities but I still stand by that because the problem now is several people have said that even in my degree to go out after 5 kilometers you are almost committing suicide it is even worse in communities like Goza, Burma, Guzama and other places and it is super risky in the isolated areas and remote communities. So in the interim, in order to secure the space, you just have to create safe havens for that. And my idea is you don't re-settle people and expect them to strive unless you have integrated some kind of capacity building and economy activities. So, uh, doing some village resettlement scheme, I think, is still kind of Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just uh, one point I'd like to make. Uh, PCNI said they are looking to help some of the most vulnerable people. I hope you won't forget the category of the school. So, <laughs> <laughs> point was made very clear. As long as they are registered. <laughs> but one of the important things is if certain people, in respect of the case he made, feel left out, that is very fatal for any project that will succeed. Especially people whose livelihood is in the bush and who are likely to be your first line of intelligence when they are going about their business and they encounter some security threats for them. So he really made a very powerful point. He was very self-effacing and said he's a uh, uh, half-baked political scientist. But I think he spoke as clearly as uh, his professor and with uh, actually more passion. Okay. Okay, he said something about... Sorry, did I get the name right? Okay, 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 okay sorry. Uh, he said something I would like to uh, emphasize, and this is with regards to we can't get anywhere until we tell ourselves the truth, hope on the basis of facts. We shouldn't be playing with words as to what our situation is, because what it does is it degrades our ability to be able to assess our position correctly and then find the right prescriptions. This is with regards to the state of the war and where we are. And I'm very glad that you came out clearly and said, look, we are in a war, we haven't won, we haven't degraded anything, we should just face the problem and deal with it. One thing happened not at this session, earlier uh, this morning, when I think you read the comments or uh, someone said, how can't we defeat Boko Haram, the most powerful army in Africa. It is not. We are not the most powerful army. We are not even the second most powerful. We are not even the third most powerful. We are not. 
But what we should tell ourselves, we have the capacity to defeat them. Forget about this high sound, whether we are first, second, or last. Because all it does is it misinforms people, and then it allows us in to fall into some false sense of security, put pressure on the military, and in the end, we are problems. So please, let's tell ourselves the truth, and then face our problems quietly and find us again. I thank you. And I think this is the point where I begin to wrap up. And just to say that um, at the end of this, uh, we're going to develop a community, uh, a document uh, that will tease out the key points that have been discussed in these two sessions. That document will be presented to BCNI um, to guide some of our at least informed uh, acts and voice to what they're doing. It will also be shared with the military and the uh, security agents uh, you know, to also add a voice and see how they eventually uh, use it. There was a direct question uh, or suggestion that next year should sort of consider uh, setting up some kind of a policy com community uh, around, around this. We are currently doing that on the advisory side um, on governance, uh, policy research, uh, reform issues. Um, and it's something we're considering doing on the security side. Um, so stay tuned. Um, and finally to say that we'll be back here again in two months' time. I have no idea what the issue we're going to be discussing, but the guys in the SPD will inform us and we will inform you. And thank you for being a very attentive and engaging audience. And uh, I believe lunch is served outside. And please hang around. Let's continue the discussions. And a round of applause for the panel as well. <laughs>